I am not Ed Conway. I am Ed Prysdale. You can uh, distinguish us because I am, uh, I guess I am P equals 0.1 taller. Um, I am really pleased to be here to introduce our second recipient of the 2016 Center for Blood Research Earl Davy Award for outstanding contributions to the field of hemostasis. That is John Weissel. Uh, he is a professor in the Department of Cell and Developmental Biology at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine in Philadelphia. He received his Bachelor of Science in Engineering at Swarthmore College just outside of Philly and his PhD in Biophysics from Brandeis University near Boston. That's where his inauguration into the complexities of blood clotting began. He has continuously and impressively applied his engineering bias in unique and creative ways to help us understand the mechanisms in hemostasis and thrombosis in tangible and highly visual ways. And most of you have seen pictures and ripped them off of the internet that this gentleman has published. <laughs> Too bad there aren't royalties. John is going to be telling us today about the structure and properties of clots and thrombi. Thanks, John. Thank you very much. It's very nice to be here. Um, my, uh, the background of my title slide is a scanning electron micrograph of a whole blood clot. And you can see here the various components, so platelet aggregates, fibrin fibers, and red blood cells and white blood cells that are trapped in the clot. And the next slide is a, another scanning electron micrograph. This is a part of a thrombus. Now, uh, cardiologists often will go in with a catheter and aspirate thrombi to open up a coronary artery that's been blocked by a heart attack. And we've looked at these uh, coronary artery thrombi. This is one example. And you can see here, I've colorized to make it easier to see the various components. You see platelets in purple, the microparticles are in blue, fibrin fibers in yellow, and there are some small uh, cholesterol crystals that came from the uh, ruptured plaque in green here, and a few red blood cells that are peeking through here. So um, this is a system for studying hemostasis that many of you probably know about that was originally developed by Barbara and Bruce Fury in Boston and is now used by a number of other labs uh, where they ha take a living mouse on a stage of a confocal microscope and uh, dissect out the cremaster muscle which is shown in the lower left here and this is a very thin muscle so it's possible to uh, injure the small vessels that are here and study the formation of clots uh, in, in, in the living mouse and use various fluorescent antibodies. What I want to point out here is that this is an example of all the different processes we need to understand in order to understand hemostasis and thrombosis. And these occur at the molecular and submolecular level all the way up to cellular level and, and to the macroscopic level. And what I tried to do here is list some of these processes. Probably some of you can tell me aspects I've left out but um, my point here, especially is to the younger people, we know pieces of all these different processes. We don't, there are some we know very little about still, and no one has tried to put all this together. So the point is there's still a lot to be done, a lot of important work that needs to be done in this field. And to narrow this a little bit to the two areas that I've worked on, platelet aggregation and fibrin polymerization, this is a list of just some of the processes we need to understand, going from the molecular level at the top down to the cellular level, and then to the level of uh, clot or thrombus. And again, we know some aspects of what happens at the molecular level. We know less about the cellular level, and there's still a lot to be known in terms of in the living animal that you'll hear some about in uh, Alyssa Wilberg's talk next. So. Uh, I'm going to start with platelet aggregation. These are scanning electron micrographs of resting platelets, these flat disc-shaped cells. And when they're activated, there's a shape change. 
and they also aggregate, they aggregate via an, a membrane protein, an integrin alpha 2b beta 3 in the platelet membrane that becomes activated and binds fibrinogen. This is what that complex looks like by transmission electron microscopy and this is our model for this interaction um, from the crystal structures of fibrinogen and alpha, alpha 2b beta 3 so that fibrinogen forms a bridge between two platelets binding via the end regions of the fibrinogen molecule to an integrin in one platelet connecting to another platelet. And the integrins have to be activated. There's a conformational change that's shown in the lower right here. So how do we study these interactions? In biochemistry, we often will measure a KD. Uh, this has to be done in solution. It's done under equilibrium conditions, which means it's independent of time. There's no flow of mass or energy. But in biology, these processes are usually occurring on surfaces, and they occur under non-equilibrium conditions. So they're time dependent, and there's flow of mass and energy, especially in the vasculature. So we have elected to study these interactions at the single molecule level using an instrument called an optical trap or optical tweezers. This allows us to study the forces between molecules and their biological function, which is platelets in flowing blood. And we can study the strength of the bond and the kinetics of the interactions. So what is this instrument? If you have a light microscope and you put a laser beam through the optical path of the light microscope, at the focal point of the objective lens, you can trap small objects. So we often use a latex bead, and if you put a protein on the surface of that bead, then you can touch the bead to something else, another protein or a cell, and measure the strength of those interactions. So this is useful for trapping and, and pulling experiments. So I, this is like the tractor beam in Star Trek, uh, and I'd say it's a microscopic version of the tractor beam, or you could say it's a primitive form of tractor beam. <laughs> so why, why do we want to do these single molecule pulling experiments? This allows us to distinguish between affinity and avidity changes. Avidity means there's clustering of the receptor in the membrane. Um, we can avoid cooperative effects. We can detect multiple activation states and conformational changes. We can measure working distances, lifetimes, and dynamics of the forces. And we can detect heterogeneity. And these things are all possible because we're studying these interactions at the single molecule level, one molecule at a time. So what can we learn from pulling experiments? This is what Mark Twain said we can learn from pulling on things. The person that had took a bull by the tail once had learned 60 or 70 times as much as a person that hadn't, and said that a person started in to carry a cat home by the tail was getting knowledge that was always going to be useful to him and weren't ever going to grow dim or doubtful. So we can learn a lot by pulling on things, but it's not easy, it's difficult. So this is what our instrument looks like it's a light microscope on an optical table and there is a laser with optics to put that laser beam through the light path of the microscope and in the back focal plane we have an instrument that allows us to measure the position of the beam to nanometer precision and this is what allows us to measure forces the way we do the experiments is we have a pedestal that we make in a, in a, a liquid chamber we can put one molecule, for example, uh, receptors covalently bound to the pedestal. We put the ligand covalently bound to uh, beads that are in suspension. We can trap that bead and touch it to the pedestal. I want to point out that we can also do experiments with cells. And uh, this is just showing an example we did of experiments with platelets. So we can put fibrinogen onto the beads and touch that, those beads to the platelet, arresting platelet or activated platelet, and measure those interactions. So this is what an experiment looks like. We have a schematic diagram here showing the trapped bead that's approaching the pedestal. When it touches the pedestal, there's a displacement of the center of the bead from the center of the trap that shows up on the trace below at B here, and then if a bond is formed, when you rupture that bond, you see a peak in the negative direction. These peaks are in the order of tens to hundreds of piconewtons. 
So what is a piconewton? First of all, a newton is a unit that represents about the weight of an apple, named after Newton. <laughs> and a piconewton is 10 to the minus 12 newtons. A piconewton is about the weight of a red blood cell, just to give you an idea what these forces are. So these are, are forces that are involved in non-covalent protein-protein interactions. And this is what an experiment looks like. So you have to do this, as I, met, as I mentioned, these are single molecule interactions. So you have to do this 1,000 or 10,000 times, and you get a, a histogram like this, which shows the distribution of the rupture forces. You have a very high probability of low rupture forces because any protein will interact with any other protein non-specifically, and these non-specific interactions are, uh, are very weak, so the rupture forces are low. The specific interactions in the red curve uh, represent specific protein-protein interactions that are relatively strong. And this is an example of the integrin alpha 2b beta 3 interacting with fibrinogen with various controls. And if you do this experiment, for example, with, uh, with platelets and vary the concentration of ADP so that you have different levels of activation of the platelets, you can see the effect of the level of activation on these histograms. We can also look at the effect of various inhibitors. These are some of the inhibitors, some, some of which are used uh, clinically for um, controlling thrombosis and uh, various inhibitors like PGE1, which is inhibiting the same path pathway as, as aspirin. And these, you can see the inhibition of these interactions. So we can look at the inhibition uh, at the single molecule level. And these experiments then allow us to understand the ligand receptor interaction at a chemical level, detailed chemical level. So we have been able to show that there are at least two conformations of the integrin, the receptor, and that the binding interactions of the ligand, fibrinogen, with the integrin are different with these two conformational states, and we have measured all these rate constants of the, of the interactions that occur here. I'm not going to go into detail on that now, um, because I want to talk next about fibrin polymerization. So this is a confocal image of a plasma clot, and in plasma, if you have about 2.5 grams per liter of fibrinogen, that means there's 0.25 grams per 100 milliliters, or 0.25% of the volume is the fibrin. So this is really a remarkable structure, that you can have a gel that does the job of hemostasis uh, with this very low volume fraction of, of protein. This is a, its mechanical properties I'm going to talk about are remarkable for such a gel. I want to mention this paper uh, by Malpighi. Malpighi was a scientist in Italy who was one of the first people to use the light microscope to look at biological specimens. And in this paper, uh, which was published in 1666, this, he, he describes the structure of cardiac uh, thrombi. And he also makes clots from, from blood, lets blood, takes blood and lets it clot, and looks at those also and concluded that these are related structures, which we know nowadays. And he says, if you enjoy a pretty sight, examine this blood clot with a microscope. You will see a fibrous texture and a network of nerve-like threads where small meshes and honeycomb-like interstices develop. And he describes the structure, this is the structure of the fibrin network. And so the, I wanted to mention this particularly because this year then represents the 350th anniversary of the discovery of fibrin. This paper is not indexed in Medline, but you can find English tran translations of it that are available. So this is the way that process works. This is a crystal structure of the fibrinogen molecule, and polymerization occurs by what are called knob-hole interactions. So there are knobs in the central region of the molecule that are normally covered by fibrinopeptides, and when thrombin cleaves the fibrinopeptides, it exposes those knobs, which are then available for interacting with holes that are constitutively active at the ends of the molecule, and you have what we call this two-stranded protofibril that, that's formed. This 
uh, these interactions are really much more complex because we have two pairs of fibrinopeptides, and so two pairs of knobs, and two pairs of holes. So, uh, and this is just a representation of this from molecular dynamic simulations of we, we don't have a crystal structure of all the fibrinogen molecule or these particular interactions, but this, this is a simulation. So how do we study these interactions? Because the, these, uh, polymer, these are insoluble, time-dependent, non-equilibrium systems, as I was mentioning at the beginning. So, and you have a mixture of different species, monomers, oligomers, polymer, different binding sites. You have different two pairs of knobs, two pairs of holes. So there's a lot of potential interactions. So we've used our optical trap system to study these interactions uh, specifically. And we can do this because we can put, for example, put fibrinogen onto the pedestal, and then we add thrombin to the system. That converts the fibrinogen to fibrin. So we have fibrin monomer covalently bound to the pedestal, and then we can wash away the excess thrombin and put beads in suspension that have fibrinogen on their surface, and then we can study the uh, knob-hole interactions. So we've characterized these interactions, um, but I just want to talk about one set of experiments, which I think is probably the most interesting. And these experiments were done with the optical trap in a little bit different mode. Here we used what we call a constant force mode. So we, instead of measuring the rupture forces, we touch the bead to the pedestal and pull with a constant force and measure the bond lifetime. This allows us to get more information about the kinetics of the interaction. And this is a, this, a data trace which shows what this experiment looks like. And with these experiments, then we can plot the average bond lifetime as a function of force applied to the bond. So what does this mean? So with most bonds, the harder you pull, the more likely you're going to be to break that bond. So uh, this is what you'd expect. If you pull on something, it's more likely to break. Uh, it's, so the, this is what's called a slip bond. And almost all bonds have this characteristic that the harder you pull, the more, like you, more likely you are to break that bond. But there is a counter, counterintuitive um, finding here that over this force range from about 10 to 40 piconewtons, at the harder you pull, the stronger the bond becomes. So this is what's been called a catch bond. So it's a very, it's a unique kind of protein-protein uh, bond where the harder you pull, the stronger the bond becomes. And these types of catch bonds have been found in a few other systems. And you can see from where I've looked at other protein ligand receptor uh, pairs that have catch bonds, most of them are in the blood clotting system because in, the, in flowing blood, you have forces that are applied to that ligand receptor bond. And in these cases, you want the bond to be strong enough to withstand those forces. So these systems have catch bonds, which makes them stronger the harder you pull. So next, I'm going to talk about the molecular origin of the mechanical properties of clots. And why do you care about mechanical properties? Uh, clot stiffness is necessary for hemostasis. So uh, hemostasis is, best, is basically a mechanical function. You have to have a structure that's strong enough to prevent bleeding. And weak clots uh, are associated with bleeding. And I'll show you a little bit of data later on hemophilia, for example. Uh, stiff clots are associated with heart attacks and strokes. So the mechanical properties of clots vary depending on, on the, uh, the system. Clot plasticity may be necessary to prevent obstruction by thrombi. And mechanical properties determine whether or not embolization of thrombi occurs. Um, the mechanical properties determine the response to many different treatments. And also, finally, fibrin is a promising material for many clinical uses in tissue engineering and regeneration and also fibrin sealants. So when we study the mechanical properties, we have to study those properties at all different levels of structure all the way, I said here, over six orders of magnitude in spatial scale. So we study the mechanical properties of whole clots at the centimeter scale. We study the rearrangements that occur when you apply force on a clot, when you deform it um, at the micron scale. And we study the changes that occur in the molecules at the nanometer scale. 
So I'm going to show you some examples of changes that occur when you um, deform a clot. This is the crystal structure of fibrinogen, and in this diagram you can see the length of different parts of the fibrinogen molecule if they're unfolded. So one of the major findings was that when you deform a clot, you have unfolding of the fibrin molecules that are making up the, fi the fibrin clot itself. So we wanted to study the sequence and nature of the unfolding, which domains are unfolded, and wh in what sequence are they unfolded. I'm not going to go through in detail here, but just to show experiments using a combination of atomic force microscopy and molecular dynamic simulations, we have determined the sequence of unfolding here, and you can see in, this, uh, in these simulations the unfolding of the C-terminal gamma chain, which is the part that's attached uh, to, that's involved in the knob hole bo um, bonds and also attached to platelets. We also studied changes in fibrin when you deform it in different ways. So this is a scanning electron micrograph of a normal clot. If you stretch that clot, um, it looks like this. If you're pulling, the, you've got orientation of the fibers. It, this is what it looks like if you compress the clot. And using the technique Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, we can determine the amount of alpha helix and beta sheet with a resting clot and when it's deformed. And what you see with either stretching or compression, there is a dramatic decrease in the alpha helix content and, and a corresponding increase in the beta sheet. So uh, we've studied this also by atomic force microscopy, looking at the un unfolding process and uh, by molecular dynamic simulations. And here you can see that the coiled coil that connects the central and end regions of the fibrinogen molecule, when you deform the clot, you have a transformation from alpha helix to beta sheet. And this occurs in, when you apply force on fibrin um, in a, as you are unfolding other parts of the molecule, for example, in the gamma chain, C-terminal gamma chain, um, when one domain unfolds, the coiled coil uh, transiently goes from alpha to beta to take up the slack that's, that's developed as a result of the unfolding. So uh, the sequence and nature of fibrin unfolding is important functionally, and I would say that fibrinogen uniquely evolved to unfold because it has a structural and mechanical function. Um, it has these domains that are specifically designed there by evolution to unfold. Uh, so most of what's been studied in the literature and in our lab also was stretching or shearing of clots. But there was very little work on what happens when you compress a clot. And so why, why would you care about compression of clots? These are some in vivo conditions in which you will get compression of clots. And most of these are probably what you'd expect. I just want to mention the last one here, skeletal muscle forces. What I mean by this is, for example, if you have a deep vein thrombus, the muscle that's surrounding that vessel, when that muscle contracts, it's going to apply a compressive force on the thrombus or the clot. So that's why we wanted to study them. To do this, we used a unique instrument in which we have a rheometer, which is used to measure um, the stress strain, the mechanical properties of the clot on the stage of a confocal microscope so that we can um, deform the clot and actually visualize what happens when we deform the clot. So uh, just going to show a few results here. So here I would like you to look at this black curve. This is essentially the stiffness of a clot undeformed at zero here and then with various amounts of compression of that clot. And what you see is that there is a, a, a softening of the clot. The stiffness decreases at first. Uh, you have a softening of the clot, stiffness decreasing, and then a plateau. And then as you compress more and more, you, start, you have a dramatic increase in the stiffness, a very large stiffening of the clot. So what does this mean? So when we look, we're looking at the same time in the confocal microscope. These are some images that just illustrate what happens. In this case, the force, the compressive force, is being applied at the top here. And this is 
outlining a single fiber in green here from the images, you can see with compression that fiber starts to bend and then buckle. And this is the reason for the softening of the clot. The clot becomes less stiff because of buckling of fibers that are perpendicular to the direction of compression. The stiffening occurs at the end. You can see in this image at the very bottom that the fibers start to run into each other. You have crisscrossing of fibers, and this causes the dramatic increase in stiffness of the clot. So uh, some conclusions on the effect of forces on clots. The type of force matters. The structure of the fibrin molecule is uniquely suited to responding to external forces. Um, there are many potential consequences to the unfolding. For example, the gamma chain, because there are many biological functions we know of this region. And these studies, I think, also reveal a new biological function for the alpha helical coiled coil in being a molecular spring. And I didn't talk about the alpha C regions, the C-terminal alpha chain. Those are also important for mechanics. So next, I want to combine the first two parts of the talk. I talked about platelets and then about fibrin. Here is an image, a scanning electron micrograph, of a platelet-rich plasma clot. So this is combining platelets and fibrin. And I've colorized this image so you can see more clearly the platelets and the fibrin. What you see is that the platelets and fibrin are uh, intertwined with each other. You have platelet microparticles that decorate the fibrin fibers because the microparticles have alpha 2b beta 3, the integrin that binds to fibrin um, in the membrane of those microparticles. And uh, I'm not going to go into the experiments here, but we showed in this paper that the, both the binding sites, uh, the specificity, and also the strength of binding is very different for fibrinogen binding to platelets versus fibrin. So fibrin binds much more strongly uh, than fibrinogen. And this may be important clinically because most of the antiplatelet drugs are designed for preventing fibrinogen binding. But um, we think that fibrin binding in vivo is probably at least as important as, uh, as, as fibrinogen binding. And you can see examples here in the a platelet aggregate. And many of the fibrin fibers originate from the platelets because that's where the thrombin is generated in the platelet membrane. So next, I want to talk about clot contraction or retraction. The background in this slide is an electron micrograph that shows the interior of a contracted clot. And this is a form of red blood cells that uh, I'm going to describe how this uh, uh, red blood cells change shape in, in the contracted clot. So what is clot contraction or retraction? It's a volumetric shrinkage of the clot that's driven by platelets and fibrinogen or fibrin. And you can see an example here, just a tube with the initial clot. And then uh, there's this shrinkage of the clot that occurs over time that we call clot contraction or clot retraction. So this is said to be important for hemostasis, for forming a better seal, for restoring flow uh, past otherwise obstructive thrombi because the, the size of the thrombus is reduced, and in wound healing. And this occurs by um, binding of the, the integrin alpha 2b beta 3 here in the membrane binds to fibrin or fibrinogen outside the platelet. And inside the platelet, you have binding of the uh, actin filaments, part of the cytoskeleton, that um, uh, is responsible for the contraction by non-muscle myosin 2a pulling on the fibrin. So, and I call this contraction. Uh, I prefer contraction rather than retraction because it's the same basic process that occurs in a lot of other cells. This is a fibroblast shown here. So when we look at the outside of a contracted clot, we see this dense meshwork of fibrin and platelets. And inside the clot, we see mostly red blood cells that have taken on this polyhedral form, very densely packed. Uh, polyhedra, and since they're polyhedral erythrocytes, we've named these polyhedrocytes. These structures are highly impermeable by NMR. We study hydrogen de deuterium exchange rates, uh, very highly impermeable. So why do these red blood cells become polyhedral when they're compressed? So this is a, a paper from this guy, Lord Kelvin, and this is a, pa a math paper where he uh, derives the structure 
for division of space with minimal partitional, minimal surface area. And um, I think this may be the reason that the red blood cells become polyhedral, because this may be a way to minimize the potential energy of the system. And you see these polyhedral cells, for example, in the parenchyma of, uh, this is an apple and this is a potato. So you see these same kind of polyhedral cells. And we've also, we, to see if these structures occur in vivo, we looked at a mouse model. These are uh, clots from the mouse saphenous vein, and we see the same sorts of structures here. We see this dense meshwork of fibrin and platelets, and these polyhedrocytes um, making up the interior. And in fact, the polyhedrocytes make up the major part of the volume of these mouse uh, venous clots. And I'm going to talk briefly now about uh, some, just a few examples of differences that occur in different uh, diseases. This is an example. We took blood from uh, acute is ischemic stroke patients and studied their contraction. And what we see, this is uh, 85 stroke patients and 79 controls. What you see is in the stroke patients a much lower extent of clot contraction and the kinetics of contraction are also different. So we think this may be relevant to stroke in that these thrombi would be more likely to be obstructive if they're less contracted. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about hemophilia A. This is a study with plasma from hemophilia A patients. With no factor VIII added, you see by confocal microscopy uh, this very open structure. Um, and then with adding different amounts of factor VIII, you see a dramatic change in the structure of the clots. They become um, much hi more highly branched, thinner fibers, and when we do rheometry to look at the mechanical properties we see in these different patients, an increase in the stiffness of, of nearly twofold in many cases. So the clots uh, from the hemophilia patients without factor VIII are much less stiff, much weaker than uh, the clots with, with factor VIII. And we also did experiments with hemophilia A mice. Uh, with, with and without added factor VIII, and we see here a change in the composition of these clots. Um, this is again the saphenous vein model. We see uh, a large increase in the amount of fibrin in the clots, and also a large increase in the amount of these polyhedrocytes. So in the normal uh, clot from the mouse, for example, there's almost no biconcave normal red blood cells, but um, in these um, uh, hemophilia clots, you, have, you see much uh, fewer polyhedrocytes, more normal red blood cells. Um, this is another study of looking at clots from patients who had heart attacks before the age of 45. Um, and by looking, by looking by confocal microscopy, these young MI patients, you see a dramatically different clot structure. These clots have uh, thinner fibers, much more highly branched, and we look, when we look at their mechanical properties, these uh, clots from the young uh, MI patients are much stiffer, and they're lysed much more slowly. So this may be an indication of why uh, those particular patients had heart attacks at such a young age. We don't really know why that is, but we did a, a study where we, with a collaborator um, to look at the changes, oxidative changes that occur um, in fibrinogen, and we found that there, there are ch changes in oxidation of certain residues, but what were particularly significant were changes in nitration of uh, certain uh, tyrosine residues in the fibrinogen uh, in these uh, coronary artery disease patients, and particularly in uh, patient, patients who are smoke, cigarette smokers. We see a large amount of um, nitration of certain tyrosine residues, and this affects the clot structure. Um, also, in, this is a flow experiment where we have collagen on a surface, and then platelets adhere to the collagen uh, uh, and become activated. The thrombin that's generated on their surface then uh, causes a fibrin to form, and the fibrin is often oriented in the direction of flow. Um, this is another example of a coronary artery thrombus like I started the talk with. And this, in this case, 
uh, this is a colorized image again. I chose this image specifically to be provocative because this is an arterial thrombus. You'd expect it to be mostly platelets, and I chose an area where you couldn't see any platelets. There's a lot of fibrin. There's a cholesterol crystal in blue and red blood cells. So we studied the composition of these coronary artery thrombi taken from patients as a function of age of the thrombus. We defined the age of the thrombus as the time between the when the patient first experienced pain, chest pain until the thrombus was removed. And what you see is a remarkable change in the composition of the thrombus. The patient got to the emergency room before three hours, three to six hours, and six to 12 hours. For every hour of ischemic time, there is a two-fold increase in fibrin content and a 50% reduction in platelets. So there's a dramatic change in the thrombus structure as a function of time, which may be one of the reasons for um, the reason for needing treatment as quickly as possible. So how are thrombi different than in vitro clots? Thrombi can be very heterogeneous and non-uniform. Um, I would say that platelets aggregate via fibrin more than fibrinogen and fibrin fibers often radiate from the platelets. Uh, the red blood cells have effects on clot mechanical properties. Some fibrin in thrombi is oriented as a result of flow, and thrombi or in vivo clots change in composition and structure with time. So I want to end by thanking the people in my lab, Rustem Litvinov, who did all of the optical trap experiments I showed you, Shekhar Nagaswamy did all of the scanning electron microscopy, uh, Irina Chernish, did the confocal microscopy and rheology experiments. Uh, Val Tutwiler is a graduate student who did a lot of the clot contraction experiments. And all of the molecular dynamic simulations and theoretical studies were done by Valery Barsagov and Artem Shmurov. Thank you very much. So how are, are you controlling for the concentration of fibrinogen? Because the carefully study showed the top quintile of fibrinogen in terms of coronary artery risk was as bad as being a hypercholesterolemic. Uh, and also the, the range of fibrinogen in the population, as you know, is, is huge. Right. So we, we did, uh, we had um, data on all of our patients in terms of uh, fibrinogen levels and other things, we didn't see a, that effect, but I suspect it's because we have too small a patient group. I think, I'm not good at remembering numbers, but I think there were maybe 73 patients, and we, maybe we'd need to have more patients uh, to be able to, to detect that effect. I would expect to see that, you're right. Um, the, the problem is here that these studies are very time consuming to do this quantification of the images, so it's hard to do a lot of patients with a lot of the methods we these biophysical methods um, it, it that particular study took about five years just to, to collect the the data to quantify the thrombi yeah I'm wondering how much the degradation of this fibrin clots is affected by the structure so let's say the beta sheet structure and the helical structure are they in a different rate degraded by uh, by plasmin for instance how much effect uh, is that, the that's degradation? That's a good question. Um, we don't have a clear answer to that, but um, after we sh published some, some of our findings on the effect of, of uh, the stretching of clots, uh, Krasimir Kolev in, in Hungary uh, studied the effect of stretching on fibrinolysis, and sh he showed that there was a dramatic decrease in fibrinolysis in stretched clots. So, but he didn't quantify whether there was change from alpha to beta, so we don't know that part of the equation. So. Okay, while they're going there, John. So these polyhedrocytes okay. over here. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Are, are they just going on? Uh, are they go undergoing some kind of structural change, or are they vesiculating? Because I'm I'm really alluding to Nigel's point that there are a lot of red cell microvesicles or microparticles yeah. rather. Are they coming from there? You think? That's a good question, but. We don't know, but I think um, when red blood cells are, when packed red blood cells are prepared for the blood bank, uh, so we, we looked at uh, 
the effect of centrifugation, for example. So we thought, is there something special about clotting, or is it just the force? So we did centrifugation, and we see the same changes. We see they become polyhedral. So uh, whatever changes are occurring would be present in the stored red blood cells as well. But I don't, I mean, I know there's problems with storage of red blood cells, and maybe if, if there is vesiculation, that, maybe that could be part of it. I, I don't know. Hi. Um, I thought that your um, microscopy experiments were really interesting, uh, specifically those that have Thank to you. deal with optical traps. Um, so my first question is, is the instrument that you use to do the optical tweezer experiment, is that uh, specially designed for your research group? Uh, yes. So yeah. it's, <laughs> it's basically a light microscope on an optical table with all the optics. You can buy uh, optical traps that are pre-made now. Right. Uh, I think there's a company in Germany that makes them. But at least when we looked at them maybe five or six years ago, they weren't accurate enough to do the kind of measurements we wanted to do. But they may have improved since, mm -hmm. since then, I don't know. Um, and then also, um, you may have alluded to this already, but I think that the experiment that you were looking at, it was a single bind binding event that you were looking at with your optical trap. Um, can you use optical traps for multivalent binding events? Because I know that a lot of cell-cell interactions are multivalent in nature. Yes. So it depends on, on the strength. Um, the optical trap, you can measure forces up to maybe 200 piconewtons or maybe a little bit more depending on the strength of your laser. Um, if you want to go, so, so we have look, we have in some cases we've measured multivalent interactions of relatively weak uh, binding pairs. If they're stronger, then you have to go to atomic force microscopy, and that's been used to study these binding interactions also. Thank you. John, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Elisa Wahlberg, who you see right over there. Uh, she obtained her bachelor's degree and her PhD from the University of Chapel Hill, and with postdoctoral training at Duke, so she is a homegrown girl. She is a leader in understanding the once considered insignificant role of red blood cells in clot stability, um, and she has made milestone advancements. Uh, that's uh, exactly what she's going to talk about today, I think, because I've seen Elisa speak several times, and I'm never really quite certain what you're going to put into your talk. So I'm looking forward to this. Thank you very much, Lisa, for coming. Sure. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Ed and Ed, Dr. Davey, for the opportunity to present uh, at this conference. Um, so I have, I put these in, I have no uh, relevant financial d relationships to disclose. Um, and I, these are the objectives that I submitted for the CME request. And then I thought I'd leave them in here because it was, seemed like an organized way to start the talk. Uh, so by the end of 20 minutes from now, and no more, um, I hope you will, because <laughs> I'm afraid of that guy. Uh, I hope you'll gain new insights on venous thrombus composition, on the role of fibrinogen structure and thrombosis, and on mechanisms mediating red blood cells and thrombi. And although John and I did not in any way coordinate our talks, I think they're going to dovetail pretty well, um, and they're going to wrap up towards the end of this in a, in a nice fashion. So this is the, uh, a major area of emphasis in my lab. Uh, we've been looking at venous thrombosis for the last few years um, because it is a major public health concern. It affects about one to two individuals per 1,000 each year in the U.S. and similar numbers in Europe as well. Um, it, it has a high mortality rate, about 10 to 30 percent, within the first 30 days of diagnosis. And that's usually uh, associated with uh, presentation of pulmonary embolism that accompanies the venous thromboembolism. And then in surviving patients, there's still a significant loss of quality of life. Up to about 50 percent of those patients develop the post-thrombotic syndrome, which is uh, hugely problematic. Uh, the thing about venous thrombosis is that we really just still don't understand very much about how uh, the mechanisms that trigger it. So a few years ago, we put together this cartoon to try to sum up at least some global sort of gross mechanisms that we think are feeding into this. And so the idea, we think, is that these tend to originate in the valve pockets behind the vein where the normally uh, laminar flow goes non-laminar, uh, resulting in endothelial cell activation. 
And then there's endothelial cells, express cell adhesion molecules, maybe also a little bit of procoagulant activity, all of that's uh, controversial. And those cell adhesion molecules serve to recruit leukocytes to that area. And then the leukocytes do uh, elaborate procoagulant activity. And that procoagulant activity ultimately results in the production of that thrombus. And in particular, in the venous uh, thrombi compared to the arteriothrombi, these are really known to be very rich in red blood cells, as John talked about, and in fact are known as red clots. So this is actually what one looks like. This was um, from a patient who was seen at UNC hospitals. Uh, so what you see here is this, in this head region here, these lighter pink uh, areas. That implies that there's some platelet component to this thrombus. But what they're really known for is this long tail here. This very dark red color uh, indicates that they are very rich in red blood cells. And that gives them this characteristic uh, appearance and, the, and the, the nomenclature of red thrombi. You can really appreciate then if you do microscopy on those clots, uh, this is a transmission electron micrograph. And so what you see, these sort of misshapen ghost-like things here are the red blood cells. These are these polyhedrocytes that John just mentioned. And you can see that they're squished because of the contractile forces uh, that arose during clot formation. And then intercalated in and among the red blood cells, you see this material here is the fibrin because this is in cross-section. It looks a little different than the images John was showing. The proximity of the red blood cells and the fibrin within this part of the thrombus had always suggested to us that there may be a mechanistic component to this or a relationship between these two, but that's something we've only recently come to uh, begin to understand and appreciate. So the other thing I think you could tell from John's talk, and this is true from mine too, is that a fibrinogen is a very passion-inspiring molecule. And those of us that study it um, really enjoy it. So we put up this, uh, this slide here just to say it's a large molecule, about 340,000 molecular weight, and present in high concentrations in plasma, about 2 to 4 mg per mil. And as John said, it's a hexamer composed of two pairs each of three polypeptide chains. So there's two A alpha chains, two B beta chains, and two gamma chains. And this looks like what you just saw, N termini here in the center, and then the C termini radiating outward. And of course, during coagulation, uh, thrombin is the enzyme that converts fibrinogen to fibrin. Now, you just saw you can do an awful lot of fun things with fibrin, so this is one of the fun things you can do with it. This is an experiment that colleagues of mine in the physics department at UNC did. So they basically formed a strand of fibrin across a channel and then used an atomic force microscope to effectively pluck that fibrin fiber like you would a guitar string. And from those kinds of activities, they can make a number of measurements, including the elasticity, how well it can return to its native space, the extensibility or how far it can be stretched, and then also the stiffness. And when they did those kinds of studies, they noted that fibrin fiber has enormous elasticity and extensibility and can extend on the order of spider silk. So you can readily appreciate what a cell may encounter as it comes across fibrin within the circulation. All right, so with that brief introduction, I'm going to cover three short vignettes that uh, sort of help us understand how fibrinogen may contribute to thrombosis. I'm going to talk about how fibrin structure contributes to thrombosis, what mediates that red cell presence in the thrombi in the first place, and then this third point gives away the second point, but how does factor 13A promote red cell retention in the thrombi? So if we start with this first point, um, although we've both just said that thrombin converts fibrinogen to fibrin, what we haven't yet said is that it's actually a more complicated process than that. The concentration of thrombin that's present when fibrinogen is converted to fibrin dictates uh, very much about the structure of that clot and, and, and consequently its, um, its function. So low concentrations of thrombin produce very coarse fibrin networks composed of thick fibrin fibers. And these clots are known to be uh, highly susceptible to fibrinolysis. And those structures are the ones that we typically see in patients that have a history of bleeding. So hemophilia patients make these very coarse networks and thick fibrin fibers. And then the, th the uh, higher concentrations of thrombin result in the formation of very, very dense networks that are composed of thin fibrin fibers. And those clots are very resistant to fibrinolysis. And we tend to see these kinds of structures in plasma clots that are from patients that have a history of uh, thrombotic events, including myocardial infarction and also venous thrombosis. So with that um, knowledge, this um, observation that hit us about 20 years ago um, became very intriguing, and that was that individuals with elevated prothrombin, or the zymogen precursor to thrombin, have an increased risk of venous thrombosis. And that was particularly identified with the um, recognition that the G2210A mutation in the 3' prime untranslated region of prothrombin that raises the plasma prothrombin level to about 115 to 170% of results in a threefold increased risk of venous thrombosis. So it's not, not that much change in the prothrombin level, but a significant increase in, in thrombosis risk. And this is the second most common genetic risk factor in European Caucasians. It's second only to that factor V Leiden mutation you heard about earlier. 
So we did a biochemical study, this is now about 15 years ago, in which we looked to see how prothrombin might alter the way thrombin is generated and the effects on clot structure. And so we found that as we increased the concentration of prothrombin in a clotting reaction, we got increased thrombin generation. And it wasn't just increased thrombin generation, but it was an increased rate of thrombin generation, peak amount and total amount of thrombin generation, or the ETP, if you're a cat connoisseur. So the idea then is if there's increased thrombin present, it gave us an idea that we should look at the fibrin structure, and so we did. And what you see here in transmission electron micrographs and scanning electron micrographs and confocal images, um, that the presence of elevated prothrombin levels present during that clotting reaction results in the formation of a denser network that are composed of thinner fibrin fibers. And so we had this direct then effect on how the elevated prothrombin levels might have a functional consequence on the clot. But that didn't really end the story for us. So about five years ago, we had the opportunity to revisit this once again and look to see what the effect of elevated prothrombin might be on thrombin, uh, thrombus formation in mice. So for this experiment, we infused healthy wild-type mice with prothrombin to raise the level of circulating prothrombin. So these mice are otherwise healthy, and the only thing we've changed in them is the prothrombin. And we did an inferior vena cava stasis model to induce thrombus formation. And when we did that and then harvested the thrombi 24 hours later, we saw significantly increased thrombus weight present in the hyperprothrombinemic mice compared to the control mice. This was very interesting to us given all the earlier data that we had. And so when we folded this entire story together, we decided this may be the mechanism here that elevated prothrombin levels lead to increased thrombin generation. And increased thrombin presence leads to the, the formation of a denser fiber network. And the denser fiber network leads to uh, increased thrombus weight. But there's a little bit of a black box here because we didn't still understand quite what was going on. We had a clue at the time and we didn't fully appreciate it and I don't even think it made it into the final publication. Um, but it's certainly become interesting for us now. The thrombi weren't just larger, but they had an increased red blood cell content. So given that these venous thrombi are red clots, we noted it, but we qu didn't quite fit it into the story just yet. But I'll circle back to this uh, in a few slides. All right, so what is it that mediates red blood cell presence in the thrombi? All right, so this is silly putting a coagulation cascade up in this group, but I do want to um, use it to highlight this section here. I think this is a region that gets probably less attention than everything else in the coagulation cascade, and that is that subsequent to the formation of uh, fibrin, we get thrombin-mediated conversion of factor 13 to factor 13A, and that factor 13A does cross-link that fibrin network and stabilizes it, and that cross-linking is, is absolutely critical for getting a, a, a structurally uh, sound clot formed and preventing a hemorrhage. All right, so here's an experiment that we were doing a couple of years ago to try to understand how venous thrombi form and, and what's taking place. And this is that clot contraction experiment, basically the same as what John showed. We can start with whole blood, and then we add tissue factor as a trigger and recalcify. And we can take whole blood, allow clot contraction to take place, and we end up with a small contracted clot sitting in a pool of serum. So here's what it looks like uh, in, in real life. Here's the contracted clot, here's the serum, and then here's a few little red blood cells that get stuck at the bottom of the tube. Um, what we found is when we did this in normal mice, in factor 13 sufficient mice, uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, but when we did it, to our surprise, in factor 13 deficient mice, uh, we found this, and it was entirely unexpected. Um, we found that these clots contracted uh, significantly more than wild-type clots, and so we saw uh, significantly smaller thrombus weights, and, and they were smaller because effectively the red blood cells had all been extruded and were sitting on the bottom of the tube. So this is after gravity has taken hold, and you see the thrombus here, and all these red blood cells. And we can quantify these differences in terms of thrombus weight and in terms of how many red blood cells are extruded into the serum. So we had this in vitro observation. We went on to test to see if this occurred in vivo. This is, again, the inferior vena cava stasis model. We did the stenosis model as well. And this is really what it looks like. You open the mouse and you ligate the inferior vena cava right below the renal branches, sew the mice back up, and then you come back 24 hours later. This is the distended uh, inferior vena cava that's filled with thrombus. This is a factor 13 sufficient mouse. This is what happens in a factor 13 deficient mouse. So you see the formation of significantly smaller thrombi. And when we harvest the thrombi from these mice, uh, we saw that they had very much smaller thrombus weights, um, and those thrombi had significantly fewer red blood cells present in them. So it fully recapitulated what we'd previously seen in the in vitro conditions. We went on to do a number of experiments that I actually don't have time to show, but we looked at this in factor 13 deficient plasma from, that was isolated from factor 13 deficient patients. And then we also used factor 13 inhibitors to show that the effect seemed to be specific to factor 13. 
But one of the coolest experiments that we did was in collaboration with Wilbur Lamb when we wanted to really visualize this on the molecular and cellular level to really try to start to understand what was happening um, within the clot itself. All right, so these are some videos that we generated. So what you're seeing is a video of clot contraction, and this is what happens and it takes place in normal blood. So the red blood cells are stained red and the fibrin is stained green. It looks a little bit like lysis, but it's not. There's a fibrinolytic inhibitor in here. So it looks actually a lot different than we anticipated that clot contraction would look. You can't see the movement of the red blood cells very well because it's confocal, so you can't see them moving in and out of the Z-plane, but you can appreciate that all the red blood cells are staying within that thrombus as it contracts. All right, so the movie that I'm about to start is one that we did in the presence of T101, which is a factor 13 inhibitor, and what you see is dramatically different. So you can see these red blood cells just extruded from the clot almost, almost violently, and you see that motion starting from deep within the thrombus, showing the really substantial platelet contractile forces that take place during clot contraction, um, leading to a collapse of that fiber network at the surface, um, and the red blood cells sitting on the, effectively the wrong side of that clot. So these videos have been actually, they were surprised to us to see it take place quite like this, and they've been pretty hypothesis generating uh, since we originally generated these. All right, so that brings me to the third point here. How does factor 13 do this? What is the molecular mechanism that results in factor 13 mediated retention? So a little bit of uh, information about factor 13. Uh, it's a heterotetramer. It has two A subunits and two B subunits, and that's the, the form of it that circulates in plasma. And we've recently shown that it circulates bound to fibrinogen. Actually, that was known. But we showed that it's bound to fibrinogen at gamma residues 390 to 396 and the B subunit of factor 13. So we've cartooned that out here. And that particular interaction is critical for normal factor 13 activation um, because uh, during the thrombin-mediated release of these fibrinopeptides that John mentioned here and then subsequent association of these fibrin monomers, you see one here, one here, and one here, it positions factor 13 right where that thrombin is so that it can be readily activated by the same enzyme that's activating uh, fibrinogen, converting fibrinogen to fibrin. And we've gone on to show, actually, that when you don't have that interaction, when factor 13 can't circulate bound to fibrinogen, what you end up with looks like factor 13 deficiency. So we get delayed factor 13 activation, so delayed release of an activation peptide. And then this is what the in vitro clots look like. You notice they look very similar to the factor 13 deficient uh, scenario with the production of much smaller clots and the extrusion of a lot of red blood cells from that thrombus. And when we do that inferior vena cava stasis model, we again saw the production of smaller thrombi with decreased red blood cell content. So that interaction is actually really important and something that sort of captivated our attention recently. All right, a little bit more about factor 13. It cross-links glutamine and lysine residues in the fibrin gamma and alpha chains, and it can also cross-link other plasma proteins, including alpha-2 antiplasmin, fibrinectin, and taffy to fibrin. And those cross-linking interactions are critical for fibrin function and fibrin integrity and stability. When it does those things properly, uh, factor 13 can effectively increase res uh, resistance of those clots to fibrinolysis, and as John pointed out, it can mechanically strengthen the fibrin, um, and that mechanical strength is critical uh, for fibrin function. And then one last um, bullet point here, we were privileged uh, last year to collaborate with Kristen Kastrup's group and Steve Hurd to show that uh, factor 13 is ultimately inactivated by thrombolytic activity, and I think you'll hear more about that in a, in a talk a little bit later today. All right, so when we tried to start figuring out how factor 13 was mediating the retention of red blood cells, we actually started with what was probably my favorite hypothesis in my entire career, and that is that factor 13 cross-links red blood cells to these clots and keeps the red blood cells in. And it was logical, and it suggested to us that if we could identify a new receptor on the red blood cell, we may be able to uh, capitalize on it. It may be a new target for something, and we may even get to name something. Um, so we did a lot of experiments to try to understand how the red blood cells might be getting cross-linked into this clot. And in spite of everything that we could do, we couldn't demonstrate and still haven't been able to demonstrate any cross-linkable substrate on the red blood cell surface. It's simply not cross-linked into the clot. Um, we also showed that red blood cell retention doesn't even seem to require any of those canonical non-fibrin substrates. So if we omit alpha-2 antiplasmin and taffy and fibrinectin from the reactions, we still get normal red cell retention. So eventually, we let go of this hypothesis. And then we re refocused our efforts on, on the one that maybe we should have really gone after in the first place, and that is that maybe factor 13 does what we know factor 13 does, and that is that it cross-links fibrin, and in reinforcing that fibrin network, permits the retention of red blood cells somehow in that clot. 
All right, so here's the first experiment we did. We thought maybe what factor 13 is doing is increasing the fiber network density. So it's making the network tighter and then the red blood cells can't get out. So we first looked at the relationship between fiber network density and red blood cell retention by generating clots uh, with different fiber network densities. So this is low, medium, and high effectively. And we did that by varying the tissue factor concentration. And then when we did this in whole blood under identical conditions, we saw in fact that increased fiber and network density does result in less release of these red blood cells into the serum and the formation of clots that are larger. And so it kind of did fit that network density does contribute to the way red blood cells are retained within the thrombi. But when we formed these clots in the presence of T101, which is that factor 13 inhibitor, we saw really no differences in the fiber network density or structure. And that's actually consistent with what people have previously demonstrated. And so um, that led us to think that maybe structure isn't, isn't quite what was going on, um, but the factor 13 is still doing something fascinating because in spite of the fact that it's not changing the structure, uh, when we put that factor 13 inhibitor in the whole blood clots, we got dramatic increases in the amount of red blood cells that are lost in the from the clots and the, the weight of those clots that are formed. All right, so what is it doing? Um, well, we know, as I said earlier, that factor 13 cross-linking generates um, uh, cross-links in the gamma and alpha chains. And specifically, it generates the formation of gamma-gamma dimers and alpha chain-rich high molecular weight species. And so if you see this here, this is fibrinogen run out on the gel, A alpha chain, B beta chain, and gamma chain here. And this is a cross-linked fibrin clot. These are the gamma-gamma dimers, and these are all the higher molecular weight species that form during clotting. We know from uh, studies that others have done and we have done that certain concentrations of factor 13 inhibitors inhibit primarily alpha chain cross-linking, which is sort of an interesting observation. But you can see this here, that when we titrate in T101, that factor 13 inhibitor, we see the loss of higher molecular weight species before we see the loss of gamma gamma dimers. And we can quantify this by doing densitometry on these, clot, uh, on these blots. And so you see here, again, that lower concentrations of T101 are required to stop uh, the formation of higher molecular weight species that are required to block gamma-gamma dimer formation. So what we then did is we titrated in T101 into whole blood clots and asked, what is the concentration of T101 that leads to the loss of red blood cells from these clots? And it turned out that it correlated very strongly and very tightly with the formation of these alpha chain rich high molecular weight species. So this led us to the conclusion that clot weight correlates uh, very strongly and very specifically with alpha chain cross-linking. Right, so that observation is a little bit in the weeds, but this is, this is where it actually gets really fun. Um, because I get to come back to that initial image that I showed you and feed right back into what we just learned from John's talk. It turns out that alpha chain cross-linking is predominantly responsible for the, uh, an increase in fibrin elasticity and stiffness. And so these are some data out of Martin Guthold's uh, group in collaboration with Robert Arians showing that in a variant of fibrinogen that can only undergo, I lost my pointer here, that can only undergo on the right hand two columns of each of these plots, in a variant that can only undergo alpha chain cross-linking and not gamma chain cross-linking, um, the alpha chain cross-linking can, uh, alpha chain cross-linking can result in increased fibrin elasticity and increased fibrin network, network stiffness. And so that observation, we put this story together, we haven't been able to show it, but this is sort of what we're looking at um, moving forward is that maybe um, fiber stiffness is actually mediated by, uh, the fiber stiffness is mediating red blood cell retention in these clots. So we've gone from sort of a biochemical observation back to this mechanical observation and maybe integrating the two. They're not separate functions in fibrin, but they're acutely tied to one another. So this is our working model. Um, what we think is going on is that following activation of coagulation, particularly in static blood, um, we get the formation of a clot and we get platelet-mediated clot contraction. So when in the presence of plasma hypercoagulability, like the elevated prothrombin study that I showed early in the talk, uh, you get the formation of a very dense fiber network. And that dense fiber network is very effective at retaining red blood cells, leading to the production of larger thrombi and potentially increasing the risk of venous thrombosis. But if you do that same process in the presence of reduced factor 13 uh, activity, or even if factor 13 activation is delayed, you get the formation of a clot, but the fiber network isn't appropriately reinforced by cross-linking to retain the red blood cells. And so as it contracts, the red blood, red, red blood cells can effectively escape, uh, leading to the reduction of small thrombi, and that may in fact be a potential antithrombotic target then. That's something we're still taking a look at. 
So if I summarize these points, um, we've shown that fibrinogen is causative in the etiology of venous thrombosis. That wasn't effectively, especially uh, known when we began these studies, um, but we've clearly shown direct effects that the fibrinogen isn't simply around, it's participating. Um, we've shown that thrombin generation promotes a venous thrombosis, at least in part by altering fiber network structure. Um, but we've shown that fiber network density and factor 13 influence red blood cell retention and venous thrombi, and that they do this um, independently, but potentially in an additive fashion. Um, we've recently demonstrated that factor 13 binding the fibrinogen residues uh, gamma 390 to 396 are really a critical component of this, and they're essential for normal factor 13 activation and activity, and consequently clot formation and red blood cell retention. And we've attributed this effect to fibrin alpha chain cross-linking and shown that it's essential for red cell retention and clots. So together, um, we, we sum up all of this by saying the fibrinogen factor 13 axis, which hasn't received a lot of attention historically, but um, I think is actually getting, uh, becoming much more commonly studied now, um, mediates venous thrombogenesis that's both thrombus formation and composition, and is a really interesting um, process to continue to study. So these studies were done in collaboration with quite a number of people um, in the U.S. and abroad, in, including some collaborators here in Canada. Um, so I'm just actually going to um, identify the students in my group um, that really deserve a ton of credit for doing this. And that's in particular Maria Alleman here, um, who was a former graduate student. And she actually is the first author on both the Prothrombin study and the JCI Factor 13 study, and really um, didn't give up even when it took us a very long time to figure out what was going on with the Factor 13 part. And then Jamie Burns, who's a current graduate student in my lab, um, and he's really followed up Maria's work and looked at the, the basic, um, the, some of the more mechanistic aspects of what's going on. And Saravia is um, a slightly younger graduate student in my group now who's also continuing to look at factor 13 and exactly how it's contributing to what's going on in, in uh, clot formation. Thank you. Uh, so that was great. Okay, so two questions. One, um, have you, has anybody ever looked at the, uh, does, do lymphocytes and neutrophils, and do they get incorporated into the clot in the same manner, and is that correlated to the red cells? And then the second question, which is un totally different, is um, can, make, can you make any comments about the role of thir factor 13 in thromboembolism, you know, a la Peter Gross's stuff? Peter uh, Gross's stuff, yeah. yeah. All right, so the first question we don't know is, we, it, it, they, they are definitely stuck in there. Um, interesting data we haven't been able to sort through yet. So if we do, if we look at the thrombi and the factor 13 deficient mice, they have a lower leukocyte content. If we look at the, but they're fully deficient in factor 13. If we look at the, the leukocyte content in, in clots from those fib gamma mice that have normal factor 13 circulating, it's just not bound to fibrinogen. They have normal numbers of, red of leukocytes present in those thrombi. And so we're trying to determine whether the factor 13 is helping to retain the leukocytes in there, or what I didn't mention is there's actually factor 13 in the leukocytes as well, and that it may, the factor 13 may promote their retention, but be a completely different mechanism than what we're seeing here. They also have particular receptors on their surfaces um, that enable them to interact directly with fibrinogen. And so it, I think it's going to turn out to be a really different story. All right, so Peter Gross's stuff, yeah, I've been following this too. Uh, so you, uh, to just fill in the background, so when they look at, um, they've, been, they've done a mouse model of using factor 13 deficiency, and they were originally looking at um, embolization. So they do a ferric chloride application to the femoral vein, and then they look to see how much material flies off of that um, clot as it's forming. They actually originally showed that dabigatran increases the amount of embolization, and they expanded that to then to show that factor 13 deficient mice embolize faster. And so there's been some concern maybe that the factor 13 deficiency would le lead to loss of clot stability and therefore um, increased risk of embolization. And I, I don't know. I don't know. The model that they've done is a rapidly forming thrombosis model. Um, that's quite a bit different. It's actually red cell poor. So if you do, if you look at the histology of those clots, there aren't any red cells present. So I don't know if they mimic enough of what's going on in venous thrombosis for us to, to know how well factor 13 deficiency would contribute to embolization in this kind of a pathology as well. Yeah. I'll ask you later. Okay. Can unplug? I'm going to unplug. No other questions? Yeah. Lisa, thank you so okay. much. Yeah, thanks.
Next we have uh, several PhD students and fellows speaking. I have no idea how the, the committee selected these four out of the excellent abstracts that were submitted. Uh, we won't be asking questions, but they're going to give uh, four or five minute very short talks describing their work. The first person is Steve Herr. Uh, he's a PhD student in Christian Kastrup's lab and is affiliated with the UBC Center for Blood Research in the Department of Biochemistry. And he's going to tell us about factor 13A is cleaved by thrombolytics in vivo. Where are you? Thank you. Does it work? Cool. All right. Hello, my name is Steve Herr, and as uh, Dr. Prizedale mentioned, I'm from the Kastrup lab. Uh, so I'll be talking today about the degradation of 13A in thrombolysis. So as Alyssa mentioned, uh, 13A, 13A is activated at the end of the coagulation cascade by thrombin, and then its main role is to covalently crossing fibrin to itself and to other proteins to make it resistant to lysis by plasmin. So people have long known about how it's activated, where it's synthesized, but the method of inactivation has remained rather elusive over the years. And serendipitously, I noticed that when I incubated 13A with plasmin, that I, on a Western blood, the 13A signal was disappearing. So we decided to test this hypothesis that 13A can be inactivated and cleared by enzymes of fibrinolysis. So we incubated 13 before it was activated with plasmin at various concentrations, and we see that it does not get degraded by plasmin. At as, as high as 100 nanomolar of plasmin. However, when we activate the 13 with thrombin and then incubate with plasmin, then even at lo as low as one nanomolar of plasmin, we're able to see degradation of 13A, suggesting that plasmin can specifically inactivate the active enzyme but not the zymogen. Then we wanted to identify where the cleavage was occurring, so we cleaved the uh, 13A with plasmin and did a mass spec analysis to identify the cleavage site, and we found that the primary cleavage site occurs at after lysine K46 which is indicated in red here. In the activated form, it lies in close proximity with the catalytic uh, cysteine of 13A. And in the zymogen, it lies on the opposite side of the activation peptide that's released by thrombin. So all this work so far has been done in purified systems, and we want to investigate if this occurs in whole blood as well. So in whole blood, we activated the, plas the plasma, or the whole blood, with thrombin to generate 13A and then we treated it with TPA, which generates plasmin to degrade the clot. So we see that at two hours, we see it being degraded, and definitely at four hours, we're seeing that 13A is being cleared, and this reaction can be inhibited by addition of antiplasmin or tranexamic acids, which is an inhibitor of plasmin, suggesting that plasmin can inactivate 13A in whole blood when making it more physiologically relevant. Then we wondered, is 13A regulation altered in patients receiving thrombolytics? So when a thrombosis patient is brought into the hospital, one of the treatment methods is the injection of tissue plasminogen activator, which generates plasmin to degrade the fibrin clot. So in collaboration with uh, Dr. McCann, who is an interventional radiologist at VGH, we, just, we recruited so far six DVT patients who are receiving thrombolytics as a treatment uh, so what we did was we collected their blood before and after the treatment and also during their recovery period and analyzed their blood for 13 levels. So this is our uh, representative data. Um, so in patient one, we, when we activated 13A, when we generated 13A before the from the blood that was collected before the treatment, we see that 13A remained stable over the course of four hours. However, in the blood that was collected at the end of the treatment, that 13A was degraded over the course of four hours, and this degradation did not occur during the recovery period. This suggests that thrombolytics can lead to the inactivation of 13A uh, in, in patients receiving thrombolytics. However, that's not the case in all the patients, as you can see in this patient three, that 13A remains stable over the course of four hours in the blood that was collected at the end of the treatment as well. So as I mentioned, we've collected six patients sample so far, and in two of the six patients, we see 13A being degraded as a cause of, as a result of thrombolytic therapy, and in the other four, we have not noticed the degradation. So we're currently in the process of uh, correlating the, the dosage as well as the duration of the TPA treatment that these patients have received, 
as well as the plasmin concentration that's found in the whole blood. Um, so in conclusion, so we noted found that plasmin specifically cleaves 13A but not 13, and in patients treated with thrombolytics, that 13A is degraded once it can be generated. So one of the future directions is to investigate in patient in conditions where higher concentrations of the TPA are administered to the patient, such as in uh, stroke patients. So thank you. Our next speaker is Frank Lee, and it says here on my list, insert multiple adjectives. <laughs> he, he's an MD-PhD student in the Prizedale lab and affiliated with uh, Canadian Blood Services, the UBC Center for Blood Research in the Department of Pathology and Lab Medicine. Uh, the title of his talk is Plasmin Cleaves Factor 5A to Accelerate Clot Dissolution. Frank. Hi, so thank you to the CBR for giving me this opportunity to present my work. As we've heard before, the well-established role of factor five is in forming blood clots as a cofactor for the generation of thrombin. And I'm excited to show you data today that suggests that factor five may very well play an important role in breaking down blood clots as well. The structure shown here should not be present in a, in a healthy individual. This is a histological cross-section showing, showing a thrombus or a blood clot. And these blood clots that obstruct the normal flow of blood is a leading cause of death worldwide. Stroke, myocardial infarction, and pulmonary embolism are all life-threatening conditions in which blood clots are the major contributor. Although clots are heterogeneous in composition, uh, this image from Dr. Weissel, you can see here that um, fibrin is a major component, and fibrin forms an insoluble meshwork that provides the clot structural support. And the drugs that we use in the clinic to, cl to uh, to, to a dissolved blood clot to work to cleave and dissolve this fibrin structure. So fibrin is formed from fibrinogen through the coagulation or clotting cascade. And physiologically, fibrin regulates its own dissolution by acting as a cofactor for two important blood proteins, tissue plasminogen activator and plasminogen. The association of fibrin, TPA, and plasminogen into a ternary complex is critically dependent on the presence of C-terminal lysines on fibrin. And this greatly enhances the binding of TPA and plasminogen and accelerates the conversion of plasminogen um, into plasmin. Our lab has, ident has identified a feedback mechanism in which clotting factor 5A, which we know is, is a, plays a central role in the clotting cascade, um, is, undergoes a feedback mechanism where it's cleaved by plasmin to expose C-terminal lysines, which are important in binding TPA and plasminogen, thus allowing factor 5A to participate in plasmin generation. I designed, so I designed this assay to measure the enhancement of plasmin generation by factor 5A. If you look at the profile in red, you can see that the addition of factor 5A accelerates the, um, the generation of plasmin compared to TPA and plasminogen alone, shown in green. This occurred after a lag of 25 minutes. And if we look at the cleavage profile of factor 5A, you can see that uh, the heavy and the light chain of factor 5A is cleaved into, into fragments. And the appearance of these fragments correlate to the development of TPA and plasminogen cofactor activity of 5A. And this cleavage takes time, which is why in this assay you see this lag in the beginning of the experiment. So, so I repeated the assay with factor 5A that was pre-cleaved with plasmin and then incubated with TPA and plasminogen. And you can see here that the lag in the previous slide was completely abolished. And if you look at the profile in blue, significant enhancement occurred starting at five minutes. And the results of this assay um, strongly suggest that factor 5A requires cleavage by plasmin in, in order to gain TPA and plasminogen cofactor activity. I then want to see whether plasmin cleave factor 5A could enhance the dissolution of a fibrin clot. So in this experiment, I, uh, so I designed a two-step clot dissolution assay where we took purified fibrin clots and we overlaid them with TPA and plasminogen. If you take a look at the profile in red, you can see here that we followed clot, dilution, clot dissolution over time through light scattering. And when we added the plasmin cleave factor 5A in blue, uh, you see an enhancement in fibrin clot dissolution compared to TPA and plasminogen alone. And to quantify, the, to quantify this enhancement, we just took the area under the curve for both of these profiles and compared the two, and uh, the difference was highly significant. So to review uh, the protein structure of factor 5A, Factor 5A consists of a heavy chain and a light chain non-covalently associated together through calcium. And the C1 and C2 domain of the light chain are critically important in binding anionic phospholipid on, for example, activated platelets. 
And I showed you evidence today that plasma cleavage of factor 5A confers TPA and plasminogen cofactor activity. Uh, protein sequencing done previous in our lab, previously in our lab has shown that <coughs> plasma cleavage um, results in two C-terminal lysines, one on the heavy chain and one on the light chain. And both of these C-terminal lysines are important in binding plasminogen. So further understanding this mechanism of 5A being a cofactor for TPA and plasminogen is interesting because um, 5A is essentially localized to anionic phospholipid due to its C1 and C2 domains. So effectively, um, a fragment of 5A could potentially um, participate in plasmin generation locally at the site of the clot. Um, so, yeah, thank you for listening, and if you would like to, lo like to know more about uh, my plans and future work, please visit me at uh, poster 13. Thank you. Good job. Our next speaker is Alex St. John, who is a, an MD in the Division of Emergency Medicine and holds a uh, of Science in Epidemiology. He's a research fellow training at Bloodworks in Seattle, so welcome. Uh, he's going to tell us uh, about the effect of small von Willebrand factor fragments in von Willebrand factor self-association under elongational flow. Hello, I'm Alex St. John, as he mentioned. Um, I'm at uh, Bloodworks Northwest uh, Research Institute in Seattle in the lab group of Dr. Jose Lopez, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here. I'll be talking today about the effect of small VWF fragments on VWF self-association under elongational flow. VWF is a massive protein that is secreted by endothelial cells and platelets and plays a critical role in primary hemostasis. It is secreted as ultra-large VWF multimers that then self-associate in regions of high shear stress, such as in vessel injury, to create long VWF strands. Those strands then bind platelets which triggers the um, beginning of thrombus formation. This whole process is normally regulated by uh, circulating metalloproteinase atom TS13, which cleaves um, VWF in the A2 domain. Uh, the, uh, at a, at the activity of atom TS13 um, can become dysregulated in, um, in multiple uh, disease states, including in um, TTP, where cleavage activity is very low, and in uh, von Willebrand disease type 2A, where cleavage activity is very high. And the cleavage by atom TS13 um, results in the loss of um, the ultra-large VWF multimers into smaller, less adhesive multimers, um, which also creates small VWF fragments as a byproduct. However, the effect of these small VWF fragments remains unknown. Our hypothesis was that small VWF fragments inhibit self-association by acting as chain terminators. To test this, we used a microfluidic device that Dominic Chung mentioned earlier, uh, based on one developed by the Diamond Lab in Penn. It consists of a 60 micron width channel with a 30 micron width block in the center to induce a uh, high shear gradient, which, indu uh, which uh, causes elongational flow and triggers self-association. To create our VWF fragments, we incubated purified VWF with atom TS13 uh, in the presence of an unfolding agent uh, for a total of 16 hours and later removed atom TS13. As you can see from the gels here, uh, the uh, uh, VWF multimers present in that sample were cleaved down nearly completely to um, its smallest components. To run our microfluidic assay, um, we ran the VWF fragments that we created um, as a mixture with normal purified VWF immediately through uh, the channel. In real time, we monitored VWF strand formation and measured strand thickness at a distance of 30 microns below the bottom of the block. Co we compared that strand thickness of this mixture to strand thickness of uh, several other controls, including two different concentrations of purified VWF and one sample of VWF fragments alone. Finally, we began to investigate the role of small VWF fragments in, in vivo by looking at three different samples of uh, human plasma, including a normal donor, VWD2A patient, and a TTP patient. What we found is that VWF fragments inhibit self-association. Looking at the video on the left, you can see that a concentration of 5 micrograms per milliliter of purified VWF results in a large amount of VWF strand formation. 
However, the same concentration of VWF when combined with uh, small VWF fragments in a 5 to 1 ratio uh, causes significantly decreased strand formation. And as a positive control, you can see that 30 micrograms per milliliter of VW, purified VWF also causes a large amount of strand formation. And a sample of VWF fragments alone causes virtually no strand formation. Quantifying the uh, videos that you've just seen over time, you can see that both samples of purified VWF um, formed a large amount of strands and that this was inhibited by the addition of small VWF fragments. Finally, looking at patient plasma, compared to normal plasma, the plasma of a TTP patient, which has very few small fragments, uh, forms greater strands. And the plasma of a VWD2A patient, which has a large amount of small fragments, formed fewer strands. In summary, our microfluidic assay successfully demonstrates shear-induced VWF strand formation. And the presence and quantity of small VWF fragments modulate VWF self-association in both a purified system and in patient samples. Uh, further study is needed in several areas. Uh, we are currently running more repetitions of the experiments I've just shown you. Uh, we're also planning to determine the effects of the small fragments on platelet function and determine uh, whether the uh, small fragments are present in several other disease states, including uh, trauma, which is of particular interest to me. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And we'll be, well, I guess we're not doing questions. <laughs> Thanks very much, Alex. Uh, the final of our four speakers who were selected from among our excellent students and fellows is Linda Yang. She's a PhD student in the Scott Lab and is affiliated with Canadian Blood Services, the UBC Center for, Bro uh, UBC Center for Blood Research, and the Department of Pathology and Lab Medicine. She's going to tell us about ULA-1, a novel pro-inflammatory bioreactor immunotherapy immunotherapy, I guess immunotherapeutic. Hi everyone, my name is Linda. I'm a PhD student from Mark Scott Lab, and today I'm going to present you a study of a novel pro-inflammatory immunotherapy, IA1. Every individual's immune system is a balancing act between the tolerance and inflammation. And the broken, uh, the broken tolerance towards either end can have both benefits and disadvantages. For example, the loss of tolerance and the enhancement of inflammation could be bad for transplantation, but good for cancer elimination. While on the contrary, the loss of inflammation and the enhancement of tolerance is good for transplantation, but could be bad for cancer elimination. And in order to treat cancer by promoting a pro-inflammatory environment, the allostimulatory approaches have been suggested effective through an allo recognition induced T cell proliferation. However, the current approaches were dangerous because of the MHC mismatch induced immune injury. So our lab has manufactured a novel microRNA based therapy, immunotherapy IA1, using the cell free supernatant from the bioreactor allo response reactions. And it is our hypothesis that IA1 can promote a pro-inflammatory to effector cell response capable of attenuating the tumor cell proliferation. The immunomodulatory effects of IA1 has been measured on the unstimulated human resting PBMCs. After 10 days of treatment, there was a significant C uh, proliferation of CD3 T cell, uh, the increased proliferation of the resting CD3 T cells, and moreover, the proliferation of both CD8 and CD4 T cells were increased with CD8s being dominant because of the large extent of increase. And this CD8 dominant proliferation resulted in an increased CD8 proportion among the total CD3 T cells with a decrease in the CD4 T cell proportion. Among the CD4 T cells, however, both pro-inflammatory and tolerogenic T cell subsets exist. So I looked further into the T cell subset differentiation. We use TH17 cells as a representative of the pro-inflammatory T cell subset because their expansion is correlated with better cancer elimination. And IA1 significantly increased the TH17 cell population. On the contrary, T regulatory cells suppress inflammation and their expansion could promote tumor progression. IA1 made no significant changes to the T regulatory cell population 
and consequently, there was a significant increase in TH17 versus the regulatory cell ratio. So I conclude that IA1 maximized the response of T factor cells, which includes CTL and TH17 cells. Then the anti-cancer effects of the IA1 activated naive PBMC has been measured on the HeLa cell proliferation. And we used an acyl acylogens instrument, which monitors the cell proliferation in real time, basing on the cell attachment-induced electrode impedance. Without cell attachment, the media only and PBMC only group did not generate an increased cell index. When HeLa cells were seeded by themselves, indicated by the blue line, cells start, uh, proliferated steadily till day six, and the curve started to go down after reaching confluence. And when HeLa cells were overlaid with inactivated PBMC, indicated by the solid lines, the proliferation curve overlapped with the HeLa only curve in the first four days, but cells started to die rapidly because of the killing by the tumor activated naive PBMC. And the larger number of the overlaid PBMC, the earlier cells died. When HeLa cells were overlaid with IA1 activated PBMC, indicated by the dashed lines, cells started to die at an early time point, and the shaded gap error indicates the enhanced killing by IA1 activation. And when there was, there was a larger number of IA1 activated PBMC overlaid, this enhanced antiproliferative effect was even more significant. Comparing to the killing by the inactivated PBMC at around day four, the IA1 activated PBMC started to slow the growth of HeLa cells at around the first day, basically bring forward the onset of inhibition by three days. And this, enhanced, uh, this inhibited tumor growth and the enhanced killing resulted in a significant decreased cell index at day seven. So to summarize, the microRNA-based IA1 exerted a pro-inflammatory effect on human resting T cells by enhancing proliferation, which is similar to allo stimulation. And among the total CD3 T cells, the proliferation of the CD8 T cells were predominantly increased by IA1, indicating an enhanced CTL-dependent cytotoxicity. Moreover, the response of TH17 cells has been maximized, resulted in an increased T factor versus T regulatory cell ratio. And significantly, the treatment of naive PBMC with IA1 attenuated the growth and enhanced the killing of cancer cells. By applying this allogenic cell-free immunomodulator, the risks of MHC-mediated immune injury could be diminished. And the future studies will try to introduce the tumor specificity to IA1 and the effects of the tumor-specific IA1 on T-cell response and the cancer cell proliferation will also be examined. Thank you. We have world-class scientists speaking for us today, um, but the next speaker is uh, probably one of two that you'll find most memorable for us tonight. Uh, our next speaker is Dan Baker, who um, is going to be telling us about uh, what it's like to live with a chronic disease as a patient, um, like we've already heard from this morning. Um, he, let me tell you a tiny little bit about him. He taught grade four music and then moved with his family uh, to Port McNeil uh, to wrap knuckles, I guess, as an elementary school principal and vice principal. Uh, Jackie Sneezewell, who we see here as his partner, met Dan at the dinner theater where he, where he started his career. So I imagine that you will be t telling us some very interesting things. These two gorgeous young women who I met last night uh, with, with, uh, with Jackie and D Dan are uh, Willow and Georgia. They're lovely daughters. Uh, both are already avid readers, but I guess that's no surprise since they're both teachers. And uh, Willow wants to be a bio biopharmaceutical engineer, is that right? Okay, Dan, you got it right. And Georgia, you want to be a vet, veterinarian? That's good. I bet you there's some veterinarians in the audience that you can talk to. Um, and with that, I'd like to say thank you all very much for joining us. Dan, you're going to tell us about what it's like to uh, live with antiphospholipid syndrome in a titled talk called Different Strokes. Okay, 
Thank you, doctors. Uh, okay, sir. My name is Dan Baker, and I have antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. When I first out, found out I had this disease, I had no idea that I would have so many difficulties. It started with a deep vein thrombosis in my leg, and that was it. Uh, no. Honey, no. You had two pulmonary emboli from that oh, thrombosis. Yeah. You told me when we met that the doctor said after your year on warfarin that you'd be fine, you just need to take aspirin for the rest of your, for the rest of your life. And that didn't seem so bad. It was uh, a number of years before I had any other major symptoms, right? Yeah, things were pretty great until a year after Willow was born, when you started getting ulcers in your left leg. Hey, didn't I have some kind of procedure for that? I don't really remember. We'll talk about your memory later, but yes. You were, you were sent to a doctor who shrinks varicose veins, but it didn't work for you, so they told you to wear a pressure stocking. Oh, yes, my pressure stocking. <laughs> Let me tell you all how much it cuts into my leg by the end of the day, and I love that. Corn schmorns. So at that point, it was aspirin and a pressure stocking. We could deal with that. Now, after se several seizures and strokes later... Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't skim over the juicy parts. These are doctors. They like medical information. Okay. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, so I had another DVT in my thigh after having a medical procedure. I think it was, uh, I was on some kind of thinner. Oh, jeez, now I don't remember. Oh, what a pair. Anyway, you did have a DVT in your thigh. And I think that's when they put you on Plavix and some kind of injectable. Oh, I don't know. Too many meds. Uh, the big change came right before my brother-in-law's wedding. I was the flower girl. I was just cute. <laughs> we were just driving up to the location when you got out of the car and fell to the ground. Which I will never live down. Uh, I still apologize to my brother-in-law and my sister-in-law for that. That was the day of your first tonic-clonic seizure. It was pretty scary. At that time, the doctor said it was likely a one-time thing, but then it happened again the next week. This began many stays in many hospitals. MRIs confirmed that uh, I had been having TIAs, a lot of them which caused enough brain damage to cause seizures. A different kind of stroke. So now that's what we watch for, signs of strokes, which I have had more of since that time, even on molecular weight heparin and Plavix, and then molecular weight heparin and aspirin. So after his two big seizures, Dan was put on various seizure meds. But since that time, those meds have increased considerably. You're now taking carbamazepine, valproic acid, and clobazam, along with seizure meds. You also have an assortment of other blood-related meds, totaling 11 pills and injections twice daily. I know. I'm the one who has to put them in your weekly pill box. Sorry about that, babe. I just don't have the manual dexterity to do that anymore, or nearly as quickly. Nice segue, Bo. There were times when I wondered if the little things I was noticing about Dan were Dan things, or man things. <laughs> you get me, ladies? Uh, the little things that I would think would be really simple to do, or would just take him so much longer, or he would need concrete directions, and still does, like making dinner, or putting the leash on the dog. Or doing cousins with, with us. us. <laughs> you do that a little too. <laughs> <laughs> the last year has been pretty tough on all of us. It involved many stays for me at the hospital, some for more than a week, and staying with my parents who were kind enough to let me live with them in Victoria while Jackie and the girls were up in Port McNeil. I had that's you? Yeah, no, that's you. I had plasma exchanges. I think that plasma is really cool and saves lives. Plasma exchanges. <laughs> Thank goodness for the nurses helping me with this. The MRIs, rituximab treatment, and eventually two rounds of chemotherapy, which I do not recommend, although they were all necessary. I, see this. <laughs> I missed out on Halloween with my girls. The view from our house and the coffee on the weekends with my wife.
Oh, I think you might be in a period of homeostasis. Cross fingers. How little did I foresee that this could ultimately affect me and my beautiful wife and children, but it has. So much so that after Willow did a science, science fair project on the disease, she declared that her life goal would be to help cure the disease that I have. I don't think it will help with your clumsiness, though, Daddy. <laughs> no, you're right, Willow. I continue to do stupid things like work out with a torn ligament, break my big toe, which really hurt and threw me into a period of waiting for my toe to heal. That is boring. <laughs> and I have problems with my balance. I fell on this uh, way to the camping trip, on, on, on this way to, on the way to this camping trip. Three times. Your arm was so bruised, and we were in the middle of nowhere. Dan seems to have problems identifying when he has pain, unless it's really bad, like when he broke his toe. I think every animal in the woods knew you broke your toe that day. <laughs> well, maybe not every animal. My children think of me as retired because I've told them as such. My neurologist told me that in his prof professional opinion, he doesn't think I could handle the stress of another position. Not to mention how my abilities have changed so, much, so dramatically. And so I am on long, long, some kind of long-term disability. I can accept this, though I have to admit it. It does throw me into bouts of depression, which my family knows too well. Now Dan is a stay-at-home dad. We can come home for lunch, and I like macaroni. I like soup. I do know how to boil some water. <laughs> really, though, our girls really have stepped up in a lot of ways. Yes, they are amazing people. It is quite humorous to discuss, with, discuss your children with other parents, because, as I've discovered in our little town, everyone believes their children to be the greatest. My children, however, are the best kids in town. <laughs> they help me with a lot of things around the house, and while Jackie is at work or doing her master's homework, one of my biggest realizations is when I finally understood things from my wife's perspective. She does a lot for me and has been doing a lot uh, for years. Now that I am home more, I hope to do more for, for, for her. You do a lot. Dan is a very good housekeeper. Now we just need to work on his handiness. So what does the future look like for my family and myself? Well, we can move to Vancouver, though, as you can see from, uh, from these pictures, we live in a big, beautiful home. Our, our children can play outside without fear. They can have fun, like I used to when I was a child. And the price of a home is far more manageable than in the big city. It also stops me from shopping. <laughs> <laughs> That's you guys. We love Vancouver, and we explore a little more every time we come for appointments, which is pretty often. I'm afraid to ask about the developments with patients who have had strokes multiple times. I am afraid that I will live in a world that cannot treat my symptoms anymore. I am afraid that I will get worse somehow or have a stroke so badly that I will become un unable to be cared for. I am afraid to ask about the developments in hematology, although I believe there must be some. After all, my disease is not that rare. Is it? One more page. Oh. <laughs> I know that I am lucky so far. I'm lucky to have a hematologist, a neurologist, and the fantastic nursing staff at the hematology department. I want to thank Dr. Jensen in particular for always being accessible and understanding. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Jackie will be better to able to answer your questions as I am better with the script.
In an effort to stay on time, I'll start introducing our next speaker, who is uh, perfectly positioned uh, after Dan Baker's story uh, uh, as a patient on antiphospholipid syndrome. It's purely fitting that we hear from a world's expert on antiphospholipid syndrome. Jake Rand is a professor of pathology and the director of the clinical labs at Cornell Medical College and New York Presbyterian Hospital. He received his medical degree from Albert Einstein College at, of Medicine and then completed residency at, of pathology at uh, Montfiore uh, Hospital and then in medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. His research career has focused on understanding the molecular basis of hemostatic disease. His talk today is called the Antiphospholipid Syndrome Enigma. Jake, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ed and Eds. Uh, I am honored to be here and honored to be at a symposium celebrating uh, your career, Dr. Davey. And <laughs> and I must say that uh, my talk is made um, easier and also more, for me, meaningful and burdensome uh, given the previous uh, presentation by the Baker family. Uh, you, are, you are the best and um, I am, besides uh, the account of the struggle with the disease, I am even more struck by how your family has responded to this difficult challenge and congratulate you for that. So uh, what my, my plan is to uh, give you a little bit of background on this uh, enigmatic uh, disorder, um, how it came to be identified in the current understanding and uh, to take you to uh, two, I think, promising um, mechanisms uh, that are, we, we, I hope, will turn out to be uh, sustainable in terms of the evidence and also potentially uh, targetable in addressing this uh, condition. Uh, so the condition, the antiphospholipid syndrome, is it's truly a syndrome of things that run together rather than being a mechanistic disorder. On the one hand, we've got clinical manifestations that include uh, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, arterial thromboembolism, stroke, and several pregnancy complications that are attributable to placental insufficiency, together with the presence of these uh, antiphospholipid antibody markers. And how this came to be uh, is a, a tribute, I think, to astute uh, clinical observations, empiric observations. The anti-cardiolipin and anti-beta-2 glycoprotein-1 immunoassays came about through the uh, development of the serologic test for syphilis at the turn of two centuries ago and the finding about uh, over half a century ago of this biologic or the identification of this biologic false positive syphilis phenomenon that turned out to be related to anti-cardiolipin antibodies and then the discovery that these antibodies in these patients, the conditions misnamed, they're not directed against phospholipids at all, but rather against phospholipid binding proteins, mainly this beta-2 glycoprotein-1. And in the course of the elucidation of this laboratory artifact came also the uh, invention of the PTT and the finding uh, at uh, Hopkins by uh, uh, Locke Conley that there is an inhibitor of this PTT. Uh, it came to be named by Sam Rappaport as this lupus anticoagulant. And it turned out that these were due to uh, antibodies that recognize phospholipid binding proteins that are capable of inhibiting phospholipid dependent coagulation reactions, misnamed lupus anticoagulants. So we've got a bunch of misnames in this syndrome, the antiphospholipid misname and uh, the lupus anticoagulant misname. Now beta-2 glycoprotein-1 is not the only target antigen. 
it turns out that there are a host of cofactors that have been recognized and the common denominator of, among them is that virtually all of them are phospholipid binding proteins. So this is a disruption, um, a gain of function abnormality in autoimmunity that is recognizing that it's targeting phospholipid binding proteins. And multiple mechanisms have been proposed. Uh, they all have some in vitro evidence, some have some in vivo evidence as well. The common denominator of this is, and I'm not going to go through them, is that, uh, or a basic explanation for why there are so many mechanisms is that phospholipids play so many roles in biology and uh, disrupting phospholipid um, metabolism activity uh, with antibodies that are recognizing phospholipids in combination with cofactors is going to result in disruptions. These aren't necessarily related to the disease process. Lupus anticoagulant phenomenon is an example. Coagulation is prolonged and yet people with this disorder, paradoxically, have accelerated coagulation in vivo. And what I'm going to do is focus on two of these mechanisms for which uh, I think significant evidence have, has developed. One is an inexin A5 uh, mediated mechanism, and the other is uh, recent data uh, collected together at Conway involving a role for complement activation. So the basis of this enigma is that we've got this syndrome and a unique puzzle because there's no mechanism, there's, so there's no gold standard. The clinical manifestations for this disorder are neither rare nor specific. So in contrast to TTP, in which there is a thrombotic microangiopathy, here we're dealing with venous thrombosis, arterial thrombosis, and pregnancy complications that are not rare. The laboratory tests don't correlate with each other generally in most patients. And patients who test positive for this disorder but haven't had a clinical event would be mislabeled as being false positives when they're actually at increased risk for a first event. So take, for example, uh, the MIND experiment of somebody uh, identifying uh, a uh, polymorphism uh, in the gene for factor V and not really knowing what the mechanism of the disorder is, well, most people with the factor V Leiden polymorphism are asymptomatic, and so uh, the significance of this would be discounted if it weren't tied to a mechanism. Uh, Anexin A5 is a member of the Anexin family of calcium-dependent phospholipid binding proteins, and a unique property of this is that this protein forms two-dimensional crystalline arrays over phospholipid anionic phospholipids, over membranes that are expressing anionic phospholipids. And as a consequence of forming these arrays, it has potent anticoagulant activity and it inhibits phospholipid-dependent coagulation reactions. Uh, the protein that was uh, actually first described in Dr. Davies' department by uh, Fujikawa at the end of the 1980s and named uh, placental anticoagulant protein 1, uh, is highly expressed by vascular endothelium and placental trophoblasts, among other cell types. Now, here is uh, confocal imaging of endogenous inexin A5 on the surface of syncytialized cytotrophoblasts. So what we do here is we take placenta, isolate the trophoblasts, culture them, they will syncytialize as, uh, to mimic uh, the kinds of villi that are present in placental placenta in vivo, and they strongly express annexin uh, A5 on their, on their membranes. Uh, here's uh, staining for nuclei, and here's double staining. Well, when we add polyclonal antiphospholipid IgG to these cultured cells, what happens is the IgG is binding, here's rhodamine staining for the IgG, and there's a marked diminution in the expression of annexin A5, this anticoagulant protein. And the same happens with a phospholipid monoclonal, an antiphospholipid monoclonal. This one recognizes domain 1 in beta-2 glycoprotein 1 that's thought to be sp particularly uh, associated with an increased risk of thrombosis. And here's a control uh, IgG and the uh, uh, continued expression of an XNA5. The same thing happens with uh, um, uh, cultured endothelial cells. Uh, human umbilical vein endothelial cells don't normally express an XNA5 on their surfaces. It's all present inside. 
um, when you treat them with storosporin and they expose phosphatidylserine in their outer membranes, they also express an exon A5. And when we do the same experiment with the HUVEX that we did with the uh, placental cells, adding phospholipid antibodies to these cells, uh, they bind the antibodies uh, strongly, reduce their expression of an exon A5, and the same thing happens with that same monoclonal that recognizes domain 1 of beta-2 glycoprotein 1. So uh, what we did here then was to take a look and see, to try to use a high-resolution imaging technology to, uh, to see what the effects of the antibodies and cofactors were on the annexin A5 crystal array. And uh, here's just the working principle of atomic force microscopy. Uh, Dr. Weisel described AFM uh, as for the purpose of force measurements and some imaging. Here, what we're doing is we're scanning a, uh, an ultrafine silicon probe uh, across uh, a surface within fluid that allows us to, to uh, get high-resolution images of molecules. And this has been used also by Dr. Marchant to uh, demonstrate the uh, tri-nodal uh, structure of, of fibrinogen in the fluid phase as well. So here is what an XNA5 looks like by atomic force microscopy. And if uh, we just focus here, what we're seeing is three an XNA5 monomers that have trimerized. And what, these, uh, uh, what this protein does is it forms trimers, and then the trimers trimerize to form a two-dimensional array across membranes that express anionic phospholipids. So uh, this uh, slide summarizes uh, our work in the area. What you're seeing on the left is um, a phospholipid surface that is mounted onto an ultra-smooth mica chip, addition of an exon A5 to the fluid, which results in the um, formation of this uh, an exon A5 array that is crystallizing over the surface. And uh, so what you're seeing here in um, from our American perspective, uh, Mexico, the wall is up here, by the way, that's that black line. Uh, Florida is uh, an exon A5 crystallizing. You get a, t a crystal across the entire surface. And when you add, when we've added the monoclonal antiphospholipid antibody along with beta 2, we get punctures within uh, this uh, surface that promotes the prothrombinase reaction. So based on this, what we did was translated these observations into a clinical assay and said, well, if this is true, then let's take membrane uh, that expresses an exon A5 and, excuse me, that expresses anionic phospholipid and then let's add an exon A5 to membrane that's been exposed to normal plasma or membrane that's been exposed to antiphospholipid plasma. And if what I told you is true, then uh, the the, uh, bile the excuse me, the two-dimensional crystal will form over the uh, uh, membrane that's been exposed to the normal plasma, but in the presence of phospholipid antibodies, there should be holes and there should be an acceleration of coagulation. And the way that we measure this is through a ratio, which we call the annexin 5 anticoagulant ratio. And what we're doing is we're measuring the coagulation time in the absence of an exon A5. Typically in our system this is going to be about 20 seconds and then adding an exon A5 which will double or triple the coagulation time. So in the normal you do get this tripling and if what I told you is correct in the patients with this condition there should be a disruption of the crystallization, acceleration of coagulation and a less than expected prolongation in the clotting time. So we did a, an initial study with blinded samples from Tom Ortel's uh, cohorts of patients at Duke University, and uh, these were, uh, uh, this was a small study with well-defined uh, patients, about 20 in each group. But then subsequent to that, in the interest of time, what we did was we did six, uh, excuse me, five different blinded studies, five different centers, coded samples, and measured the annexin A5 anticoagulant ratio. So we had a total of about 600 patients with these five studies. And this is the um, ratio within normal healthy controls. And what you see here are non-autoimmune patients 
who have thrombosis. These are thrombotic patients without the phospholipid syndrome. And for this graph, I describe them as autoimmune or non-autoimmune because not all of them have the rigorous criteria for phospholipid syndrome. All of them have phospholipid antibodies and thrombosis or pregnancy complications, but in terms of the rigorous criteria of remeasuring it after 12 weeks, etc., not all of them fit this. Uh, still, what you see is that among the patients with thrombosis, these are phospholipid antibody positive with thrombosis, a significant proportion of them had ratios that were below uh, the mean minus two standard deviations. And how we perceive this is that these are patients who have a Nexin A5 resistance as a mechanism for the phospholipid syndrome. Now these might be patients who don't have this as a mechanism, who have another mechanism, or it may be that our assay is imperfect and we're missing these patients. Um, and very interesting are these patients who have not had any thrombosis at all and yet have uh, resistance to an XNA5 anticoagulant activity. So what we did was, uh, what I showed you until now was patients who came from other centers, blinded samples, very well-defined patients. We shifted and we looked at real-world patients from Montefiore Medical Center's clinics. And what we did was, did these an XNA5 resistance assays on these patients using a this, a discovery cohort where we measured the levels and also what we proceeded to do afterwards was a prospective study of patients with phospholipid antibodies who have never, who had, who had not previously had a thrombotic event to see what would happen. And what you see here is that in the discovery cohort, when there is a level of, uh, of this anticoagulant ratio, that's below about 223, and certainly below 193, there is a marked increase re odds ratio for, developing a for having developed a thrombotic event. Here is the prospective study. So these are patients who we got their plasma before they had any clinical events, did the measurement, and observed what happened. And what you see is that there with this validation cohort of 121 patients, there is a spectacular increase in the risk of developing a thrombotic event. So we think that we've identified a significant mechanism, or if it's not a significant mechanism, at least a surrogate marker for whatever the mechanism is, that either patients with this disorder do have a disruption of the annexin A5 crystallization on their vascular endothelium, or if they don't, that at least the formation of these uh, antiphospholipid immune complexes um, disrupt, disrupting annexin A5 crystallization is a surrogate marker for, the, uh, for a pathogenic mechanism in this disorder. Well, how about complement activation? Um, Animal models, thank you, three minutes remaining. I will do it. <laughs> animal models uh, and human studies, uh, well, animal models have clearly demonstrated a, a role for complement activation. Human studies, highly suggestive. And there have been case reports of patients with catastrophic APS who've responded to eculizumib, the complement inhibitor. However, complement activation markers have not been reported to be consistently elevated in blood samples from these patients. So here is a scanning electron micro microscopy imaging of the effects of plasma control, normal plasma, and antiphospholipid plasma on phospholipid vesicles. Here's phospholipid vesicles incubated with normal plasma, and you're seeing the vesicles. Well, when, you, when we treat the, the, these vesicles with phospholipid syndrome plasma, this is what we see, a whole bunch of gunk forming. And Real, this, these images triggered uh, the idea of collaborating with Ed on this question of whether these immune complexes, presumptive immune complexes, might trigger complement. So the question that we had was, might antiphospholipid syndrome-mediated complement activation be detectable by including phospholipid vesicles in the assay system? And the hypothesis is, 
Take coagulation assays. So similar to coagulation assays where phospholipid vesicles are required to support the assembly of coagulation enzyme cofactor substrate complexes, perhaps complement activation in antiphospholipid syndrome will also be detectable by including phospholipid vesicles that bind these APS complexes. So what we did was we compared a direct assay direct assays for complement activation markers in plasma versus a two-stage assay in which we added plasma to the vesicles first, washed the vesicles, and then used those vesicles, added those vesicles to serum to see whether they activated complement. And we had six patient populations, healthy controls, phospholipid syndrome, cancer, SLE, venous thrombosis without phospholipid antibodies, and then phospholipid antibody positive patients again, without a prior history for, th for APS clinical events. And I'll take you through this rapidly. In plasma, you do see an increase in uh, complement activation markers compared to the controls, but it's not very significant. And in APS, not statistically significant at all for C5A. For soluble C5B9, um, you see uh, elevations, but again, there's a pretty broad scatter and there isn't there aren't real differences among the various groups. Um, let me take you to complement activation markers induced by phospholipid vesicles. Here, there is a highly statistically significant elevation in the generation of C5A and also in the generation of soluble C5B9 in the, from the vesicles that were incubated with plasmas from the antiphospholipid syndrome patients. And interestingly, with respect to the soluble C5B9, there's also an increase in the antiphospholipid positive non-thrombosis group. What you're seeing also, by the way, is that there are slight increases of C5A compared to controls. Um, and with respect to the C5B9, everything seems to kind of be similar to the controls with the APS being, being different. Well, um, I'll skip these because of time, but to tell you that what I would have shown you here was that uh, both the alternative pathway and the classic lectin pathway appear to be involved, and also that we can mimic this effect using purified antiphospholipid IgG and beta-2 glycoprotein 1, but not control IgGs and not beta-2 glycoprotein 1 alone. So in summary, imaging via atomic force microscopy and, and scanning EM demonstrates the formation of antiphospholipid syndrome macroimmune complexes on membrane phospholipids. These disrupt an XNA5 shielding and activate complement. Phospholipid vesicles may provide a novel platform for detecting APS-mediated complement activation and, most importantly, identification of thrombogenic mechanisms in patients with APS through novel mechanistic assays will open paths to improve diagnosis and targeted treatments. And with that, uh, I just want to acknowledge our uh, research team at Weill Cornell, Montefiore, University of Vermont for the Imaging, and uh, Ed Conway and Victor Lay here at the University of British Columbia Blood Research Center. And I'm available for any questions, and thank you for your attention. still be doing anti-cardiolipin antibodies when we've got some better ones that they're historic going back to Nigel Harris as you know everybody probably still does them but should they be doing them uh, yes uh, okay. we have better ones in theory but not in practice the anti-cardiolipin uh, are less specific but more sensitive so we have a greater likelihood of not missing patients if we do the cardiolipin as well as the beta 2 okay. I have a question. Have you ever checked to see whether the annexin 5 is displacing anything off of the cells or vesicles in order to restore the delayed clotting times? Or? Um, we've measured clotting times on cells that uh, display annexin A5, but we haven't added annexin A5 to see whether it displaces anything. 
Uh, what are the numbers of patients with this for 10,000 or whatever? How, how many people have this? Thing? It's, it's uh, well, it fits the NIH's category for a rare disease, but it's not. Um, and I think that I think that the recognition I think that the, the condition is under recognized, um, and that there may be more people with the disorder than have it than actually have been uh, diagnosed as having it. It's estimated that with with respect to stroke, that about 15 percent of individuals who don't have the classical risk factors for stroke have phospholipid syndrome as an etiology. So, Jake, this is Nigel. Um, my question was, maybe I misunderstood, but I, I'm just trying to get at where you think the coagulation is occurring, which PS positive surface. Are you, towards the end with your microparticles, is this yeah. where you think it's occurring? I mean, in a pregnancy, yeah, it's probably on the placenta, mm -hmm. right? But, but in the non-pregnant situation, I yeah. didn't quite understand. Oh, so in, in, the, in, in the non-pregnant situation, I think it's occurring on all um, phosphatidylserine exposing membranes. So for example, with respect to vascular endothelium, I think it requires two hits. There is one hit that damages the, uh, the asymmetrical distribution of phospholipid on the, on the membranes. And then the second hit is the formation of these antiphospholipid immune complexes on the membranes. And I think it's happening on microparticles. I think it's likely to be happening on microparticles and platelets as well. Uh, and uh, I suspect that red cells may also be uh, a surface in which this uh, is occurring. So uh, we, we have done uh, studies with uh, modified red cell membranes, everted that expose um, anionic phospholipids, phosphorine. So we've pushed the red cell to be able to function as a platform, but I suspect that it's, it's very possible that this is occurring on, physiolo on normal red blood cells as well. So I would be wondering, what about the complement regulatory receptor? Did you check those two? Uh, no, we haven't looked at that yet. Thank you. And the, f the final speaker of an excellent day is Jordan Shavit, uh, who is the Johnson Family Scholar and Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Communicable Disease at University of Michigan Medical School. He obtained his MD and PhD at Northwestern University in Illinois and later conducted postdoctoral work at the University of Michigan. Uh, for your information, with the 2012 Earl Davy Award recipient, David Ginsberg. Jordan is an expert in zebrafish omics and will tell us today about coagulation disorders, fishing for new diagnostics and therapeutics. Thank you for coming. It was just turning on a minute ago. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> There we go. Okay. All right. Oh, it's, it's hmm. Okay, let's try uh, medium. Oh no. <laughs> um, any, um, hmm, any suggestions? Let's see. But yeah, the movies aren't working. Um, uh, 
I think maybe there's another way to alter the display. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's what my graduate student says to me all the time. <laughs> um, oh, here we go, resolution. Uh, uh, this one, maybe? Changes. Okay. All right. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you. I'll be happy to take any questions. <laughs> All right. And I, it looks like it might be a little squish, but we'll, we'll survive. Uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to speak, for the challenge uh, to get set up. And uh, but it's, really, it's really a great honor to be here uh, uh, to um, uh, meet uh, the, uh, the people here and also to hear the interesting scientific presentations and the patient presentations as well. So I'm going to talk about using, uh, as you might guess, a uh, fish model here to study coagulation disorders. I work with zebrafish. Uh, that's not really a zebrafish. That's sort of our go blue version of a zebrafish. It had to have something for that. Uh, but what I'm interested in is uh, genetic modifiers. And so when we talk about coagulation disorders, you know, the coagulation cascade has been characterized now for over 50 years. Uh, and we know uh, from, from way back when Earl was doing some of these early studies of patients uh, who have different coagulation factor mutations and deficiencies, uh, their disease is defined based on that mutation, whether it's hemophilias or specific, other specific coagulation uh, disorders. Uh, but we have 20,000 genes in our genome, and so that's not the whole story. Uh, you can have patients who have the same mutation or the same disease, yet very different clinical phenotypes. And this is partially due to modifier genes, uh, genes that are inherited separately in the genome uh, that will alter the expression of the primary uh, state. So this is a factor V Leiden pedigree, which was uh, mentioned by uh, Alan Mast earlier. And what you can see in this pedigree is that there are 15 individuals who are shaded on the right, meaning they have factor V Leiden, which is a risk factor for developing venous thrombosis. But of those individuals, only five are also shaded on the left, uh, meaning that they've actually had an episode of thrombosis. So it's not a very helpful marker to predict which patients are going to have the disease. And it looks like in this pedigree there are probably some modifiers that are segregating separately that are either protecting from thrombosis in some individuals or making others more susceptible. So if we could identify those modifier genes, we could potentially more accurately predict patients who are at risk. Uh, and then these could also be potential new therapeutic targets. I mean, I think we're very excited in this field with all the new therapies that are coming out, and I don't want to diminish that, right? New anticoagulants, uh, new agents for uh, bleeding disorders. But when we look at other, say, cardiovascular disorders, like hyperlipidemia or hypertension, uh, heart failure, there are often maybe four or five different classes of medications, and each one of those classes may have two to five medications. Whereas we really have a very, just a handful of medications, all based you know, precisely on coagulation factors. So I see you know, the idea of getting at new therapeutic targets could potentially enhance our, our treatments. So when it comes to getting at genetic modifiers, the, or the power of genetic studies is to have large pedigrees. And human pedigrees have served us well, but they're relatively small. Uh, mouse pedigrees actually are, based on inbred strains of mice, mouse pedigrees can be infinite, but they're, as the PIs in the room who work with mice will tell you, uh, we are quite limited by cost and by space. And so that's why we've turned to zebrafish as a model. This is, this is actually an underestimate of the difference that you get from zebrafish to, uh, to mouse. One zebrafish mating pair will produce two or 300 offspring uh, in a single mating, and they can do that on a weekly basis, so we can make very large <laughs> pedigrees. <laughs> They don't have pregnancy, so <laughs> if, anyone, if anyone was thinking about that, uh, fertilization is external, uh, which is actually another advantage of fish uh, that I'll come back to in a second. But I, I always like to mention, to remind people that fish are a vertebrate organism, uh, and the genome's been sequenced, and we can see the coagulation cascade in there, and nearly every coagulation factor can be identified in the genomic sequence. Uh, as I mentioned, there's no pregnancy. It's all external fertilization. And so you start out with a single cell embryo. That is a cell right on top of this big ball of yolk. And the yolk provides all the nutrition uh, that the fish need to survive the first week of life. Uh, and they go through uh, development very rapidly. And by three days, or three to five days, they look like this, uh, which you can see here in the bottom. And uh, this, this is known as the larva. Uh, it's embryonic to larval transition. I usually just refer to them as embryos. And during this period, you have ne nearly every major organ system undergoing development. And so you have a beating heart, and you have flowing blood, and blood cell development. 
Uh, so we and others have looked for ways to induce hemostasis uh, in zebrafish, embryos, and larvae. And uh, as I, th I think I said, they're, they're optically transparent so we can see blood flow. And you'll see in this movie here, uh, one way we've done it is by injecting bovine thrombin through the retroorbital space here. Uh, and you can see, hopefully it shows up well, yeah, you can see blood f flowing across the yolk sac uh, and then through the heart. And then after two minutes, we get a big clot. Uh, there's no blood flow or almost no blood flow going through there, no blood flow going through the heart. And then within five minutes, we get recanalization and fibrinolysis. Uh, so we, we see all the stages of clotting there. Now this, is a, this model had a little bit too much variability, so we've turned to laser injury, which was actually first done by uh, JAG, uh, Puder JAG de Swaran. And this involves endothelial injury with a laser in the arterial venous circulation and the formation of a blood clot. Uh, this is the venous circulation. And at the arrow is where we have the laser hit, which just happened. And you'll see the formation of a clot, which will eventually uh, completely occlude the vessel. And we can measure that time to occlusion as a phenotype. And we have tagged the beta subunit of fibrinogen with uh, green fluorescent protein. Uh, so we can follow it. And you'll see in a similar uh, experiment in the venous circulation again that the clot is, uh, consists of fibrin. So it's a, a fibrin-rich clot, which you can see here. And then in the arterial circulation, we have a line where thrombocytes are tagged. So zebrafish don't have platelets. That was a mammalian adaptation. They have thrombocytes, nucleated cells, that will respond much like platelets do. And you can see at the site of laser injury there, we get thrombocyte aggregation. And that's, again, at the arterial circulation. So like mammals, the arterial circulation, we tend to see thrombocyte-rich clots uh, or you know, pl platelet-type clots. And in the venous circulation, we see fibrin-rich clots. Uh, now, this is a movie where we have the red blood cells are tagged with a red fluorescent protein. Again, this is the arterial circulation. And you'll notice that the movie with laser injury is right there. And it looks much like our thrombocyte uh, movie. So we can see here, you know, along the lines of Alyssa's work, that red cells may be playing a little bit more of an active role in the clot, which you can see is they're not just getting stuck there uh, because we're not achieving total occlusion in this clot. They, are, they seem to be either sticking to there or homing to there. Uh, we, we don't know exactly what's going on yet. But we can see that when we do three-dimensional modeling of these clots, uh, we can see both in a strain that has both uh, green thrombocytes and red, red blood cells, you can see that these clots are composed of both uh, cell populations. So in order to start studying coagulation in fish, what we really wanted to do was to make models of coagulation disorders by knocking out uh, the genes that are involved in coagulation. Now, I was joking with Earl last night that fortunately, he, he actually did a little bit of work in zebrafish. And fortunately, technology wasn't uh, there at the time, because otherwise, I think I wouldn't have had anything left to do uh, if he had had the technology that we have today. Um, what, we, what, what has made these studies possible, you know, the ones I'm going to talk about today, is genome editing. Uh, being uh, zebrafish just as recently as uh, eight or nine years ago, there was no way to make, uh, no easy way to make knockouts in fish. Uh, they, uh, but the, the advent of the genome editing revolution, zinc finger nucleases, talons, and CRISPR have made it easy. And a lot of this work was done in my lab by uh, Andy Vo, a, a former technician who's now a graduate student at Northwestern University, and Yang Lu, who's a postdoc who is now at Molecular Innovations. Uh, and when talents came out, Andy built a whole bunch of them and Yang injected them and we made a whole bunch of knockouts in a number of different coagulation factors. And I'm only going to talk today about antithrombin and the work that we've done with that. Uh, antithrombin, as has been mentioned several times today, right, is obviously it's an anticoagulant protein. Uh, deficiency of that is a risk factor for thrombosis. Uh, and the knockout in mice is in utero lethal due to, due to clotting. So the way we make knockouts in fish is much the way that we make knockouts in mice these days using genome editing. Uh, we did the antithrombin knockout with zinc finger nucleases about eight years ago. Uh, these are so 2008, you won't use them anymore. Uh, we've moved beyond them. They, they, they do not work well, but, but they can work if you're lucky. And we got lucky uh, with help from Keith Jung at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, who did a lot of work on, on these. We inject them into the single cell embryos. We grow them up, and then we see if they make mutations of interest. We had to inject thousands of, uh, of embryos to get these to work, over 2,000. Uh, we had 46 founder fish, and of that, we established four lines, which all had basically the same phenotype. Uh, they made various mutations that knocked out AT3. So what we expected was, of course, is that in the embryonic period, 
uh, they were going to have massive clotting like mouse embryos uh, and it was going to be lethal and it was going to be a very nice uh, model for us to study. Uh, and I think I didn't mention earlier that that first week of life, I did mention you don't have to feed the fish. You can keep 100 of those little embryos in a petri dish. Uh, that's really the best uh, place to, um, to use zebrafish uh, in that time period. Well, of course, things didn't work out exactly as we hoped, and the fish survived, which is a big surprise to us. They did die eventually, but they, they survived just fine until about two or three months of age until they started to have a die-off, and then most of them died by six or seven months of age. And when we looked at the histology of uh, fish before they started to get sick at about two or three months of age, what we found was massive intracardiac thrombi, which are indicated by the arrows in there. This is a wild type heart. Uh, this is a homozygous mutant. You see these big uh, clots. So we and when we looked at the embryos, we could see, I told you, they're, they're translucent. We could see blood flow, and it all looked fine. We didn't see any clotting, so we decided to do induced uh, assays, and this is the wild type fish, and these are the heterozygotes, and you can see they all clot within about 60 to 90 seconds. The homozygous mutants, we thought they would clot faster. Uh, instead, we saw the exact opposite. They didn't clot at all. Uh, we stopped the experiment at two minutes, uh, and if we let it go longer, they don't clot at all. And so this is what our bleeding fish look like. When we, when we knock out procoagulant factors, they look just like this. So the question is, what was going on? Well, first of all, we wanted to make sure antithrombin is doing what antithrombin does uh, in fish, that it wasn't serving some other function. Uh, it, the sequence is highly conserved. You can see the P1 arginine, where thrombin attacks, is highly conserved. We took, uh, we, we produced zebrafish antithrombin and we bound it to human thrombin. We, saw, we showed we could make thrombin antithrombin complexes. Uh, and then when we muted that, mutated that arginine to a glycine, we abrogated that complex. So at least in, in vitro, it could bind to thrombin. And then in vivo, we tested this mutated antithrombin to see, we injected it into single cell embryos, uh, the plasmid, and we grew up the embryos, and we did our laser injury assay. And what we found was that this mutant did not rescue. Uh, and this is uh, the controls. So th th to make a long story short here, basically we concluded that antithrombin is binding thrombin uh, and is responsible, and the deficiency of antithrombin is what's responsible for this phenotype. But we still didn't know why. So we had a contradiction. We had uh, embryos in larva that the response to laser injury look like a bleeding phenotype, but when then they grow up, they develop big clots in their heart, which is a thrombotic phenotype. And for the clinicians in the audience, or, or, and maybe other, other people will, will realize that this is consistent with uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation. Right? DIC, a, a disorder that's triggered by severe events like sepsis or trauma, uh, cancer, that leads to systemic activation of coagulation. Uh, with enhanced fibrin formation and microvascular thrombosis and organ failure, which is what, like what we were seeing in the adults. But then there's consumption of clotting factors that leads to bleeding, which is what we believed was happening in the embryos. So in order to test this, we, we first we had an antibody that we could measure fibrinogen levels. We, we couldn't get enough blood out of little tiny embryos, but we were able to measure it in adult plasma, and you can see here that it's reduced by about 50%. Uh, and so to assess this in embryos, what we did is we infused human fibrinogen uh, through the retroorbital circulation, and we did our laser injury assay, and you could see we get uh, partial rescue, at least a rescue in some of the offspring uh, of AT3 homozygous mutants, and in, uh, just using some control protein like BSA did not rescue this. So we felt this was consistent with DIC, but the question was where in the embryos was this enhanced fibrin formation? I, I told you that we looked in there, we could see normal blood flow, we didn't see any evidence for clotting. Uh, but yet their laser injury response suggested that they were consuming fibrinogen. So what we did is we tagged human fibrinogen with FITSI, a fluorescent molecule, infused it into embryos, and what we found was in the controls, we didn't see anything. Uh, in, in the ho homozygous mutants, we saw um, uh, deposition of this green fluorescence uh, along the, uh, this is the venous circulation here, and we found that this fluorescent signal could be blocked by warfarin, and it could be resolved by TPA, so we concluded that it was indeed uh, fibrin deposition, all co again consistent with this being DIC. And this is not laser-induced, this is just spontaneous. So what we have is we have a loss of AT3 leads to unchecked coagulation, consumption of fibrinogen, it survived, this massive insult, which is lethal in humans, is uh, survived by these, uh, these embryos survive that, and they grow up and develop adult um, intracardiac thrombi and die. So at this point, we felt like we had a really nice model of thrombosis that we could now 
really fully avail ourselves of the power of zebrafish. So what I didn't mention before is to do these genetic screens in zebrafish, we do is, it, it's called ENU mutagenesis. It's a chemical called ENU that induces mutations across the zebrafish genome in a random fashion. Uh, we incubate males uh, in this ENU chemical. We used AT3 heterozygous fish and we mated them to female untreated AT3 heterozygotes. And what happens is, is every sperm that comes out of these male fish has about 30 mutations or, or 30 genes that are knocked out or functionally uh, hit in some way. So that means every single offspring that you uh, assess is like examining 30 genes. And so if you make 1,000 fish, you've gone through the genome about one and a half times. Uh, and so we did this. It turned out to be a, a lot of work of genotyping. We went through 4,000 fish. Uh, Kater Richter, a technician in the lab, and then Yang Lu again, uh, genotyped 4,000 fish. We found 1,250 wild-type fish, uh, which means we've gone through 1,250 homozygous mutants, but we genotyped them at two or three months of age, and so many had died already. So we only saw 266 homozygous mutants, which is we, we expect to see a drop-off. But it's a simple assay. We're just looking for 83 homozygous mutants to survive. So of those survivors, we got 53 that survived beyond seven months. And 26 of them were robust enough to produce offspring. And of those, we were able to establish five lines. So five lines where 83 homozygous mutants live where they used to die, potentially containing some mutation in a gene that's modifying the phenotype and could be a modifier gene. Uh, so next, we turn to whole exome sequencing uh, to try to map these genes. This is done by a student in the lab, Steve Rigorski, who when he applied to, he's an MD-PhD student, when he applied to medical school, he looked like this, and after working in the lab, now he looks like this. Uh, but he's gained some wisdom. Uh, he, he's, he's done a lot of great work uh, with the whole exome sequencing, uh, si single-handedly uh, taking this along. So this is what the survival of the fish look like. The black uh, line indicates the homozygous mutants that die, and then about half of the population survive. And these are, are the ones, uh, our rescues. So we take these two different populations, and what we do is we sequence the groups, uh, and we, we do it by next generation sequencing. And then Steve runs it through this processing pipeline uh, with all these uh, different steps. Because you, with, from the sequencing, you get millions of different mutations. Fish are like humans. They have lots of genetic variability from individual to individual. So we have to sort through all this. But Steve got the idea to uh, look at the coagulation cascade. Let's just look at all the known clotting factors and see if there's any mutations there first, because that's a little quicker than trying to do the mapping. Uh, we, se we sequenced uh, fish from, each of, uh, from three lines so far, and we found a couple of coagulation factor mutations, which was very exciting. Uh, but out of these three, what we had to do is we had to look and see which of them would segregate with the, you know, you, you would expect that if this was really the cause of their survival, you would see them, all the surviving fish would have the mutation and all the dying fish would not. And out of these three lines, we only found so far that the one line uh, is the, uh, has a mutation in prothrombin, uh, which seemed to correlate with their survival. And when we look at long-term survivors, uh, two years, we can see they're all heterozygous for this mutation. Uh, this is a, a control lane here. So a mutation in prothrombin is leading to survival in an antithrombin deficient strain. Not a big surprise, but I'll, I'll come back to that later. First, a really important thing that we have to talk about is how we name this fish. So in zebrafish, we like to, we, is a tradition of naming fish based on, uh, naming mutants based on how they look. And you can do it by, uh, you know, what, what, how they appear, or you can also do, do it based on what they mean. And there's a lot of references to pop culture here. So I keep thinking about vampires uh, when I do this. Uh, you know, what did Queen Victoria and vampires, slayers, and vampires all have in common, right? There are some that are in favor of bleeding, and there are some in favor of clotting. Uh, and so I just, uh, you know, I, I've seen there all this Buffy the Vampire Slayer and True Blood and the Twilight series. I've seen them all, not because I wanted to, but because my wife watches them. Uh, but of, of course, you know, I, I had to keep her company so she's not scared. So um, what we picked is, uh, uh, or what I picked, uh, the lab, they just roll their eyes at me. We picked this uh, uh, one vampire, Deacon Frost. Uh, who is in the Blade series, he's Blade's an enemy, and we called this the Frost Mutant. There was a hematologist in the movie, so I figured that was fate, that uh, we had to, had to go with that one. Uh, she's, you, you know, can see she's really dedicated, she's experimenting on herself to find out how to beat vampires. So this mutation was in prothrombin. It was in the, a highly conserved cysteine residue, across, which is in present in all the species that we had sequence on. It's in the heavy chain in this uh, loop right here. 
And we made a separate knockout line from using talons in prothrombin to confirm that this was the definite cause because it's possible there could be some other mutation that's linked to prothrombin that's the true cause. Uh, but what we found is when we made a separate knockout and we crossed it to the untreated AT3 background, you can see here that fish that are, hom these are all homozygous for AT3, but only the ones that are heterozygous for prothrombin survive. You can see that this group dies and this group dies uh, compared to their expected numbers. So we conclude that this is responsible uh, for the frost mutation. It is due to prothrombin. So in summary, what we have here is we have an unexpected survival in this, in this mutant that is you know, lethal in humans and lethal in, uh, in mice. Uh, they survive early on, but then they have this unexpected, much later lethality. And this su suggests a couple possibilities. One, that perhaps there are some protective species-specific factors in fish. Uh, that if we can identify might help us understand clotting in humans. Or it could also be, there's a lot of differences in the fish physiology. Their blood pressures, for example, are much lower uh, than humans, and so that could be uh, a reason. Now, as I said, it's a little bit disappointing. You know, we could have predict predicted here that we might find that a mutation in prothrombin might have uh, an effect on an antithrombin phenotype. However, I think this is a really nice proof of concept for us that a 50% reduction in prothrombin will rescue this antithrombin uh, mutant model. And I told you we had those other two lines where we didn't find any coagulation factor mutations. So we're in the process of sequencing more and more fish from those lines to try to map the factor. And we, we are very uh, optimistic that we can find some unknown factors that regulate clotting. Uh, and then I, I didn't have time to talk about it, but we have some evidence for some modifier mutations that affect the DIC phenotype as well. So that's it. I, I, think I mentioned the people who had done the work. Uh, and uh, I'd just like to thank you again for inviting me, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Right, well, we're actually going to test that. We're, we're collaborating with a Canadian group, of course, uh, Colin Kretz, who uh, used to, who had done his graduate work with Jeff Weitz and is now back at McMaster. Uh, and we're going to, you know, ma we're making the mutations in human thrombin, and we'll do some in vitro assays to see uh, how it works. What I didn't mention, so that mutation, uh, actually, I think that one has not been studied, that uh, cysteine has not been studied before, so we're to, interested to see how that wor works. And then the, I didn't mention the Talon mutant we made, turned out to be in Kringle 1, which apparently nobody has looked at before. So that may be the first in vivo evidence that Kringle 1 is important uh, for thrombin function as well. So Jordan, you picked antithrombin, but I'm wondering on the other side of the coin, about the clinical parallels here of actually knocking down antithrombin in, in hemophilia patients, yeah. <laughs> which is where we're going right now. So do you have bleeding uh, phenotypes too, the, the factor VIII um, as a target, for example, for knocking, knocking out? I mean, in the pro, in, when we knock out procoagulant molecules? Yeah, yeah. I mean, factor VIII specifically. Yeah, the, the one we've had the most work on is, uh, well, fa factor VIII we have knocked out, but we're still, uh, still uh, assessing that. But factor V and factor X we've knocked out, uh, and those have the expected bleeding phenotypes. It, but it's interesting, they, so they don't clot in response to laser injury, but like the antithrombin mutant, they survive uh, uh, about, with a very similar kinetics to what I showed you. Uh, so again, it, it's apparent that you know, the, the coagulation cascade, the loss of or, or dysregulation of it in fish is much more tolerated uh, in, uh, in fish than in mammals. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's interesting, you know, I, I visited with uh, L-Nylum, right, because they have uh, been knocking down antithrombin and they were in interested in this. But apparently they have not seen, you know, what we might worry about, you know, catastrophic thrombosis uh, from their level of knockdown of antithrombin. But theirs is not complete knockdown. Any other questions? How early in evolution did the blood clotting factors appear? Yeah, it seems to be a vertebrate adaptation. The question was, the question was um, how early in evolution did uh, the clotting factors appear? It seems to be about 400, 450 million years uh, with uh, the vertebrate uh, evolution. And, what's that? The dogfish. Is that? 
dead. Hag Hagfish. Hagfish. Yeah. But 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 yeah. But uh, in other systems, right, non vertebrates, we don't see clotting. There there's been some papers that have tried to make a case. They see some of the similar domains, but it's not really the same proteins. That, you know, the, just the same individual domains are present. But it seems to be just the you know vertebrate and because I really wish it had appeared earlier. I would love to have say a, f a fruit fly model or a C. elegans model, but it's, you know we could get even more numbers and it would be easier to work with. But it's just not there. <laughs> Do they have nets? Do they have nets? Uh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, there are some uh, papers that suggest that they have nets. And we have tried, actually, to inject DNAs to see if that would affect our thrombosis model. And uh, we, we weren't able to affect it uh, that way. It must be microparticles, then. Yeah, yeah. Well, so Jag uh, believes he's identified microparticles in fish. But we haven't taken a look at that. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Dr. Conway has some concluding remarks, but before he does, um, uh, I just wanted to, uh, on behalf of all of us, say thanks to him for his tireless effort to put this event on. Thanks, Ed. Okay, so we do have a little business before I let you guys go out and drink. Um, first, we have some poster awards. Ed, I need you. Here you can read them. Bottom, from the bottom. From the bottom, third place. Third. In third place, Vivian Chan. Come on up. You've got to be kidding. Where is she? Is she here? Come on. This is rigged. <laughs> Vivian is from Christian Castrop's lab. In second place, Frank Lee. <laughs> from the Prizedale lab. And in first place, Brian Lynn. From the Prizedale Lab. Okay, so I have some thank you notes. Uh, thank yous to make sure I do. First of all, thanks to the sponsors, very much so. Very much. It, it couldn't have been done without them. Thank, uh, be sure when you go out, to, because they're not in this room, to thank Anna, Hannah, and Amar, who have really worked tirelessly from like, I know they were here at 6 in the morning, and they've been working forever on this. So please do thank them on your way out. The mic runners, the judges, and everybody else who's helped um, th uh, towards the success of this uh, symposium. So thanks. <laughs> to the speakers, of course. You were great. And all the students who presented, everybody who presented, it was a great day. I think everybody would agree. Thank you. Now, we have a very special presentation, but I'm going to call on Ross to say a few words. So I wanted just to say a few words, especially for Earl. Uh, I, was, I had the good fortune to be a postdoc with Earl between... 1977 and 1981, where I worked very closely with Dominique at Chung, 
and I was able to do sufficient studies to actually get a job here at UBC where I've had a, a wonderful career. Uh, I've told this story before, but Earl actually saved me from being deported back in about 1980. This was under President Carter, not President-elect Trump as well, uh, because I, I'd swapped from a, a J visa illegally and Earl is a really charming gentleman and he, on my behalf he spent three hours in the federal building in downtown Seattle arguing on my behalf that I should be allowed to stay in the country and after three hours he said the guy got this big book out and said well according to page 350 odd Dr. McGilvery should be deported but according to page 1120, I think we can let him stay. So, <laughs> so not only did I stay, but I received a written apology from the US Immigration Service for their error. Those are the old days. <laughs> uh, the second thing I just wanted to mention is uh, the insight that Earl, Earl has had over the years. and. I remember Dominique and I were working on fibrinogen and prothrombin biosynthesis and after a, a, a year or so we decided we really had to clone the genes for these proteins to be able to understand what was going on. So we plotted a strategy and we, uh, we cornered Earl and uh, we, we convinced Earl that we should do this cloning. And we felt very proud that we'd been able to convince Earl of this. I was then fortunate enough to go down to Baylor to work with uh, Savio Wu cloning cDNAs and uh, I brought back several clones but just before I left I thanked uh, Savio for being such a gracious host and he said, oh that's okay I was expecting you, Earl talked to me a year ago saying he wanted to send somebody down here to learn cloning so <laughs> he was ahead of the both of us. And then the last thing I, th I just wanted to mention is when we set up this symposium in Earl's honor, I did ask Earl to send me his bio sketch to help with fundraising. And so he sent me his NIH grant bio sketch from that year, which I think was about 2007. And I noticed on the top the grant number was the same as the one that I had been paid from back in 1977. So Earl had the same NIH grant for over 30 years, just renewed again and again. So scientific excellence was his uh, forte. So anyway, it's uh, always a pleasure to have Earl coming. And for the last uh, three years now, I think, He's dragged Eddie Fisher along with him, who uh, it's a pleasure to have here too. So I know, uh, Earl, this turns out to be the 10th anniversary of the Earl W. Davies Symposium here at uh, UBC. So Ed has got a cake. <laughs> Ta-da! Very, very deeply honored to be here these last 10 years. It's been just terrific and a lot of good science, a lot of good friends, 
and a lot of fun hearing all kinds of exciting research. And I truly thank Ross McGilvery and Ed Conway for their, all the work that they've done and the sponsorship that we've had for this meeting from many groups started off with Noble Nordisk Canada Nova Nordist, and they've been very generous along with other support. So many thanks to many different people, and particularly uh, my close friend Ed, Edmund Fisher, who joins me and keeps me straight. Uh, <laughs> He carries my bag uh, <laughs> when I'm feeling a little low and uh, doesn't mind when I uh, cheat him a little bit. <laughs> he says, I got to get back to a minimum wage st standard. A dollar a bag. A dollar a bag, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So many, many thanks to all of you for coming. This is just a wonderful event, and I'm just deeply honored. Thank you.